Hello again, Scooper Troopers. I'm Mr. Scriptkeeper. And I'm Mrs. Scriptkeeper. And this is the Dipshit Files number 11. And we've got a big time dipshit. Yes, we do. He is probably the most infuriating personality <laughs> that we've covered so far. Oh my God, research just fucking pissed me off on this one. Uh-oh. Mrs. Scriptkeeper has been pissed off all week about this guy. <laughs> been coming to me, be like, can you believe this guy would say something like this? And oh my God, I've been. It was so infuriating is the best word that I can describe it. And it comes out in my script. Yeah. Just for this episode, we had to add an extra thing to our meter. Infuriating personality yeah. five. His name is Todd Colehep mm-hmm. and he's a ginormous piece of garbage. <laughs> yes, he is. So join us for another Dipshit Files. <laughs> Todd fucking Cole. <laughs> <laughs> He's our dipshit today. We got the microscope on him, and what a fucking story this yeah, guy has. This is just insane. You know, he might. He's he's dangerous. He killed seven people, mm-hmm. at least seven people, and we'll find out that there's probably much higher than that. Probably. But he um, he was the one guy that. This is the funniest part of his story is the Amazon reviews. Yeah. He would buy the things that he killed people with, uh, and then leave reviews about yeah. killing people with them, yeah. basically. Mm-hmm. And that's pretty unique. Yeah. And criminal mind doesn't speak high. No. But he did do some interesting things with his criminal mind. No, he was he he'd leave these dark reviews that. I don't know. As you read through them, I, I would think that most people just chuckle, mm-hmm. you know, at the right at the s- satire, hopefully, hopefully satire. But it wasn't. No, that's Mm-mm. the crazy thing. Yeah. So the next time you're reading an Amazon Mm-mm. review and you hear somebody with this, you read some dark humor and it's like, oh, I'd tie them up with that. It's like, well, oh, fuck. Yeah. I wonder if he actually did that. There, he, this guy hurt comedy quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. Being the way that he was. <laughs> so here's what we're going to do today on the Dipshit Files. We're going to look into his life backwards. Yeah. We're going to start with, for a reason, we're going to start with his last killing and when mm-hmm. he got caught. Well, th- this one is a bit different. So I wrote this backwards because it came out in the press backwards. Right. This is uh, one of those things that people were pretty much kept in the dark about everything that was going on in his life until the big story broke. And then this dipshit admitted to everything. Yeah. He just, he pontificated for hours. So arrogant. About his accomplishments. Yeah. And he was so proud of himself. Yeah. And he's such a great guy. Mm. And he did all of this for the benefit of... Of yeah. individuals. He helped and these people by killing at, them. At one point, he told the police, you'd be proud of me yeah. if you were there. Because he cleared a Just building real fucking, quick. Uh. So that's what we've got in store <laughs> for you guys today. Yeah. Let's meet this dipshit. Todd Colehep, what a dipshit. We're here to share another shocking, interesting, or just strange, but very true story with you. Today, we're talking about Todd Colehep. Dipshit. Between 2003 and 2016, he murdered at least seven people in South Carolina. And his story is one of the most bizarre I've heard. And she's steeped in the lore of weirdos. To those that knew him, Todd was pretty friendly and gregarious on the outside. And the more I learned about this case, the more I realized... That's the kind of his whole persona. Mm. You see, if there was one word that I could use to describe Todd... Shit cunt. Titty biscuit. Cunty McLimpdick. It's fucking cocky. That was close. He likes getting his way... Well, sorry. He likes (laughs) getting his way and receiving praise for his actions. Mm. In fact, many people theorize the only victim who managed to escape Todd with her life realized this very personality trait and used it to stay alive until help could arrive. Thank goodness. Boom. Her name is Kayla Brown. On August 31st, 2016, 30-year-old Kayla and her 32-year-old boyfriend, Charles David Carver, went missing. They just decided to move in together after a few months of dating, and in order to start building their new life together, the pair was looking to pick up some extra work on the side. Kayla says, Oh, I know the perfect job. There's this guy, a real estate broker, who I met through one of my exes a few years back. I'm sure he'll have something for me. And he did. Todd was a very successful man in the area, after Dad. all, and he put Kayla to work cleaning houses for his listings. She was excited to have the additional income, and the deal only got sweeter when Todd said he had a job that both she and Charles could take on together. 
This time, it was clearing brush at his own 95-acre property, which was only about eight miles away from his actual residence. When Kayla and Charles arrived, Todd simply instructed them to wait outside while he went in to the garage on the grounds to get something. As they stood alone in the creeping silence, neither one had any idea that these few quiet moments out in the middle of nowhere was the last they'd ever spend together. Over the next few days, the couple's loved ones started to grow concerned. Kayla's friend knew something was off when all of her calls and texts went unanswered. But even when she visited Kayla's home and left notes on her car, there was no response. Mm -hmm. Charles was very close to his mother, and they talked nearly every day. So when she stopped hearing from him after August 31st, she quickly reported him missing. Soon enough, the couple's apartment was checked, and although they were nowhere to be seen, their poor dog was inside all alone without any food or water. This just wasn't like Kayla or Charles. Something was seriously wrong. They came across a dipshit. But even when the two were reported missing, there was virtually no trace of where they could have vanished. And then something really weird happened. Charles posted on Facebook. That's right. All of a sudden, just like nothing had ever happened, Charles was back on social media with posts informing his friends that he and Kayla were expecting a child and that they'd bought a house together and that they were now married. He apparently also shared out-of-character posts about digging holes, sword violence for some bizarre reason, (laughs) and chillingly, the final lyrics to Eagle's song Hotel California, which finishes, you can check out any time you like, but you can can never never leave. leave. Right. Hmm. He shared strange posts like, I wonder if I said hello, how many people would say it back? Ass. And what color ribbon supports the cure for people who can't keep their nose out of other people's businesses? Ass. Mm-hmm. Mm. And, and sometimes late at night, I dig a hole in the backyard just to keep my nosy neighbors guessing. Being the neighbor of a psychopath would be a treat. Hey there, neighbor. My bird mm. got out of my house, and I was hoping I could grab it. It's right there in your mm. tree. Right. Well, if you come in my yard, I'm going to kill you. How about that? No, oh, it's my little bird. Look at him. It's my... What'd you say? If you take one step into my yard, I'm going to slit your throat and fuck the neck. But my bird... I'll fuck your neck. Nicole. I'm sorry about that. What were you saying? These all seem to be aimed towards deliberately provoking Charles' friends. And on the last post, people commented, quote, is that what you did to Kayla and the real Charlie? And are you hinting at what you did to them? End quote. Wow. Yeah. To make things even weirder, Charles' account was sharing and liking the missing persons pages set up by the couple's families, even promoting wow. a fundraiser that hoped to hire a private investigator to look into their disappearances. None of this sat right with, well, anyone, actually. The grammatically incorrect and mean-spirited post didn't sound like Charles at all. Not to mention, the real Charles was barely ever on Facebook before that, and all of a sudden these posts were happening. Mm. The account, at one point, even posted an old picture of the couple, captioned, We're fine, which was soon deleted. On October 1st, a concerned friend commented, Where the hell is Kayla Brown? To which Charles' account responded, Kayla is with her husband, Charlie. Why can't she have any contact with us? And who is this? How frustrating. She doesn't want to, Charles' account answered. I don't believe that. I know Kayla. She's not just going to run away from everyone. You or her should at least let someone know she's alive. The people that need to know that we're okay already know that we're okay was his response. Yikes. If you look at the timestamps on these comments, though, they're only minutes apart. Whoever was replying wasn't even taking time to carefully think out these cryptic responses. And they were also a dumb fuck. One friend shared that they were sent a disturbing message from the account reading, I'm just missing to everyone else. We're both okay. Oh, okay. There's only one person that knows where we are. That person means the most to me and Kayla. She knows where we are, and we're coming that way forever. Dumb. End quote. Fuck fucking creepy this would be so hard to watch as friends and family yeah. where it's like this is absurd mm-hmm. you know I, well it, it, it somebody acting out of character like this and everyone's worried it would be i think it would be worrying yeah well as you can but prob- to think that you can imp- be an imposter of someone too and just mm-hmm. like oh, i'll just step into their life no one will notice right it's like fuck. what the, who the fuck do you think you are uh, wrong oh it wrong gets worse again. oh it gets fucking worse i know so, as you can probably guess, this wasn't Charlie using his account at all. It was Todd Tad. trying to throw people off his trail, buy himself some time, or maybe, just maybe, he was doing it purely for the fun of it, like a little performance he got to put on. I don't know. And the further we dive into his life, the more you'll see that Todd definitely cares a lot 
about having all the attention on him. Mm. Just fucking frustrating. Let's dig into this dipshit story. Let's go back to what really happened the last day of August when Charles and Kayla showed up on the property. After going inside, Todd had suddenly reemerged from the door, but the friendly facade that he was known for in town had completely drained. Now, he was dead serious, and as Kayla and Charles looked down, their hearts sank at the realization that he was holding a gun. Before they even had time to process what was happening, scream for help or run, Kayla says that three bullets were fired right into Charles's chest. Kayla's whole world screeched to a halt, and she could do nothing but watch. She knew in this moment she was trapped, all alone on the expansive property of an unpredictable killer, one who absolutely nobody in town would ever suspect to be hiding such a horrible secret. Mm -hmm. She was utterly silent and still from the shock as Todd grabbed her, placed her in handcuffs, and then led her inside of a dark metal shipping container. Fuck. This would become her prison. Fuck. She was chained by the neck, ankles, and hands, and would spend all day inside the box, except for 1 to 3 p.m. and 5 to 7 p.m. Oh, so kind of He's a humanitarian, really. At those times, each day, like clockwork, Todd would come and retrieve her, bring her inside of a two-story garage on the property, and force her to perform sex uh. acts. She would be fed, allowed to use the bathroom one time, and given a small container of water to clean herself. Ugh, cruel. She looked for any opportunity to escape, but they never came. For Kayla, time was running out. This was the hell she lived in while authorities were trying to piece together the puzzle of where she and Charles had disappeared to. All the while, Todd's posts on his own Facebook account were getting weirder and weirder, and looking back, his strange and cynical words were very telling. He had some generally questionable posts, like this one from September 15th, two weeks after Kayla and Charlie went missing. Quote, reading the news, this person is missing, that person is missing, another person is missing. Oh wait, that person just went to the beach with a friend. What? Another person found with her parole violation boyfriend. In the event I become missing, please note, no one would take me. I eat too much and I'm crabby. They would just bring me back. <laughs> on, sep on September 26, he once again took to Facebook to rant. Quote, in my family, you got backhanded for talking back or being disrespectful. Wonder what the punishment would have been if I had looted, burned cop cars and threw stuff at people. When I messed up, my mom beat my ass. My stepfather beat my ass when he got home. And the next time I went to my grandparents, I got my ass beat again. You just didn't act up. These kids and adults just don't know. Damn shame, too. They might learn to appreciate if they did. He needs a nickname. Fucking good. Fuck. I'm frustrated. He needs, I know, right? Already. We're only like 10 minutes, 13 minutes into this. I would say this guy needs, uh, he doesn't have a real nickname. The Amazon review killer yeah, or something. Yeah, that's what they deemed him. Todd the cock for brains. <laughs> Todd's cunt head machine. I don't, I don't even know. We got to come up with something. Uh, he, sh he deserves zero respect uh, from humanity for the rest. He is, he's, is he still alive? Oh, yeah. Oh, fuck. You know, okay. he kind of looks like a walrus to me. Okay. When you look at his picture, he doesn't have a mustache or anything. It's just the way his face is shaped. Okay. He looks like a fucking walrus. Todd the fucking fucking <laughs> walrus fucker. Uh, we'll work on that. But let's learn more about this piece of shit. Uh, needless to say, the hypocrisy of this post is pretty ironic, considering all the horrible things Todd's done in his life. On September 30th, he posted, quote, just admit it. You look at the news. You see the political crap and the school shootings and just the general what the hell is going on. Zombie apocalypse is starting to look better and better every day. No, it's not. On November 3rd, he shared a post that really shows how quick and short his fuse was and how he viewed almost every interaction through an angry lens mm. and really how much he loathed others or maybe just felt better than everyone else. That is a lot. You see that yeah, a lot. I know. When you get online, that is... It seems to me the people that want to talk, if you're not sharing memes and trying to brighten your, your yeah. fellow people's day. They want to show you how much better they are than you. They want to show you how much better they are and how much they hate. By yeah. showing how much better they are than you yeah. is showing how much they dislike you. I know. And they and don't it's very seem to get that. Nobody, yeah, they're not you getting know, it. For years and years, virtue signaling meant one thing and then it became kind of a talking point. So it's kind of lost its thing. But virtue signaling is when a corporation 
gives ten thousand dollars to a bunch of kids so that they can have some school stuff, and then they spend two million dollars advertising to fucking they advertise did it. Yeah. to tell everyone about mm-hmm. it. And it kind of does it, it. It's cynical because it doesn't show that they give a fuck about kids. Right, right. That it's just a tactic. And when people do it on a smaller scale, yeah, it's, it's just exactly. It's just as gross. It's and it's this. It's it's the, just as gross. It's very strange. Yeah, we're so, strange creatures. So here's an here's stop an, doing that. Here's another post. Quote: We need Ebola to come as a huge snowstorm, wipe Ugh. out half the population, then just melt away. You hear that so much. Just I, mm. just tired of entitled, rude-ass people for no reason. People who race to cut in front of you, to slam on their brakes, to make right turns. And that mother... Well, fuck those guys, obviously. Yeah. And that mother that stands in aisles at the grocery store and the dude, you know who you are, that blocks the aisle, checking out the micro brews and blocking everyone on their way to the Michelob. Fucking move. <laughs> yep. That person is just... I think wired. He's Again, just this angry. is another person that was probably out from the grave, and we'll get into that. But he's just angry. Yeah, and and so when you view the world through the lens of that, we're just in the way of the psychopath. Sorry, sir. Sorry for existing. Notice how incredibly furious Todd gets when he feels that he's been personally slighted by random strangers. Sorry, I exist. Mm-hmm. I mean, remember this because it'll become extremely important later on. The world owes him something. Yeah, but despite Todd's obvious temper online, nobody would have expected in a million years what skeletons he had tucked away in his own closet. There's a few people that I know in, in my local community where it's like, <laughs> I'm going to look at their shit a little got, more closely. It's like, you're a, cunt, now. you're a cunt a lot of the times <laughs> to people that you don't even know. Yep. I'm gonna, I want to see your basement. It I'm going to come over for, for scones or something. We'll, we'll take a look at that shit. <laughs> hey, bring it, bitch. It wasn't until authorities got a search warrant to access Kayla's Facebook account that the picture would come together all at once. Investigators began searching the online profile for clues, and that's when they saw conversations between Kayla and Charlie about the job on Todd's property on August 31st. Now the police knew what they were doing on that crucial last day, and when they went to trace the pair's phones, their worst fears were confirmed. Neither Kayla nor Charles had ever left the area of Todd's property. Police knew exactly what they had to do, but not one person was fully prepared for what they might find. Mm. At about 8 a.m. on November 3rd, one group of investigators went to Todd's house where they spoke for a while with the man, both sides remaining a bit guarded, unsure what the other was hiding. As Todd was questioned about what he knew concerning the missing couple, Kayla and Charlie, he didn't know that another team of investigators was simultaneously arriving at his 95-acre property just a few miles away to scour it for evidence. Mm. However, at this time, the authorities who were with him did reveal to Todd that they knew the cell phones of the missing persons had last pinged on his property. Todd responded, quote, oh, you're trying to find the girl, end quote. Dumb. The detective corrected him that they were looking for both her and her boyfriend. Dumb, dumb, dumb. Yes, Todd slipped up there as he was the only one who knew Charlie was already gone. That's minus one point for criminal mind. Meanwhile, not long after arriving on Todd's expansive rural land, The other team of deputies drove down his long gravel road and came upon a two-story garage. When they went inside, they were immediately concerned to see that the makeshift living space was adorned by shackles. Mm. That's fucking weird. Definitely a red flag. But then they came upon the thing that fully stopped them in their tracks. In the bathroom, inside of a lone wastebasket, was a pile of hair clippings, reddish-brown in color. They warily headed back outside to continue the search, but as the investigators came across Todd's giant shipping container and then they went to take a closer look, they were suddenly chilled to the bone by a strange noise. Someone was banging on the walls from the inside and they were screaming desperately for help. In that moment, the whole atmosphere changed. Deputies rushed to open the doors, but the container was tightly sealed shut by five heavy padlocks. Which he gave great reviews for, as we'll see. I watched the unforgettable body cam footage that captured the few tense minutes where everyone held their breath. Oh, fuck. As a few men cut and pried open the locks, and then finally they were in. The dark box was littered with supplies and crime novels, and in the very back, chained to the wall by her neck, sat a despondent Kayla on top of a dog bed. She was sitting on a dog bed that she was made to sleep on for the past two months, 
barely able to move as her restraints had forced her to stay sitting up almost all the time during her captivity. Wow. The investigators tried their best to console Kayla as they retrieved bolt cutters to set her free, verbally walking her through their attempts to free her from the shackles and informing her that she was going to be fine and that the paramedics were standing by. But despite the extended trauma Kayla had just endured, her immediate response to being rescued was clear coherent and calmer than anyone could have expected mm. her strength in the footage was beyond admirable i watched this and i had tears in my eyes during this mm. whole thing so i'm gonna i'm gonna do some quoting here okay. one of the one of the things about this episode is there's going to be a lot of direct quotes mm -hmm. a lot of this information was taken between the police and the victims or the victim that they got to talk to, and the police and Todd Kolhep during his interrogation. I think I came up with a potential nickname for Todd. Oh, really? Uh, Todd the Cunty Limp Walrus Kohep. <laughs> I'm still working on it. We'll keep we'll keep trying. You it, guys, it's can, a work in progress. Yeah, I like the Limp Walrus. It's <laughs> a good, it's a good little mental image. All right, so I'm going to go into quote here. So the police quote: Do you know where your buddy is, Charlie? Kayla. Yes. He shot him. The police. He shot him? Who did? Kayla. Todd Kolhep shot Charlie Carver three times in the chest, wrapped him in a blue tarp, put him in the bucket of the tractor, locked me down here, and I've never seen him again. Wow. The police. Okay. Kayla, again. He says he's dead and buried. He says there's several bodies here and buried out here, and he says that the dogs would be ruined if they go looking because there's red pepper. The police. We're going to step you out, sweetheart. They're looking because there's what? Kayla, red pepper. The police. Okay, tell the dog people that. Kayla. He says there's red pepper everywhere, around the car, and supposedly in a ravine. Well, End that's how you find him. Yep. Get the dogs looking for red pepper. Yep. The investigators at Todd's house were alerted to the shocking discovery, and they quickly confronted Cole Hep, letting him know the gig was up. They had Kayla, and there was no weaseling his way out of it now. After watching the police footage, Todd seemed almost frozen by disbelief, like he'd never thought he'd actually get caught. He sat there just with this shock look on his face. A lot of narcissists don't believe that anyone is smarter than them. Oh, yeah. That's one of the things about narcissism. They, oh, it's unfathomable that he, somebody's smarter than them. Good, good word, unfathomable. Authorities soon discovered Charlie's car was also on the property, which Todd had spray-painted and covered with debris in order to conceal it. It's kind of weird to me that Todd seems to consider himself a criminal mastermind mm. and thought out all these ways to keep his like dirty deeds secret, but he didn't even seem to consider the possibility that authorities could ping the victim's phones and find him that way. One sergeant would later say that he feels Todd wanted to get caught mm. so he could have an audience and tell people about his awful crimes. And I'm not, bored. I'm not surprised about that. In his interrogation, it'll come out. You'll see. He's fucking bragging. Mm -hmm. Good God. As she rode in the ambulance, Kayla would reveal more heartbreaking details of her time trapped with Todd. One of the things I found most disgusting was the harrowing way she described the sexual assaults. Kayla stated most of the time she did whatever he wanted sexually again and again. If she refused to do anything he wanted, if she said no, she said he didn't force himself on her because apparently he didn't quote unquote believe in rape. Right. But, Fuck. but he made it very well known why she was there. And if she wasn't useful, then she wouldn't need to be kept any longer. And then he would shoot her. So that's some... Uh, yeah. But he didn't rape her, right? Right. Fucking piece of shit. Yeah. This is seriously one of the most evil things I could ever imagine. Not only did he do unspeakable things to her without her consent, but it seems like somehow managed to convince himself that this was not assault. Probably in order to feel less guilty and fucking pathetic. And in turn, make Kayla feel even more worthless. Simply unbelievable. Yeah. Very cruel. Very stupid. Ugh. He's a very stupid person. And it just goes to show, once again, the mental gymnastics a narcissistic person like Todd would do to believe that his victim genuinely wants to be intimate with him, even though he's literally putting Kayla's life on the line if she doesn't comply. Yeah. He apparently also told her that Stockholm Syndrome was, would kick in soon and she'd be happy to be with him. I wonder what the syndrome is that of the opposite of that. I know. Where you believe that somebody's going to fall in love with you if you're just cruel and fucking evil to them. Well, he also, What's that syndrome? He also planned to build a soundproof room for her to live in long term. He mm -hmm. told her that. 
Kayla also revealed that Todd liked to brag that he was a serial killer and a mass murderer and that his dream was to get his body count into the three digits Mm. since it was supposedly only in the high two digits so far. Just listen to this bizarre claims that Todd allegedly boasted about to Kayla. What a dipshit. This is a quote. Okay. He said, if I was a good girl, he'd teach me how to kill. And I'd get to be his partner. Oh, go fuck yourself, Todd. He said he used to kill people for the government. He said he was a paramilitary contractor. Oh, fuck you, Todd. That when he got home, he couldn't keep from seeing the bad in everybody. Oh, stolen valor Fucking on top of this, too. Fuck you, Todd. Piece of shit. I really don't know where the whole killing people for the government thing comes from, but I guess it was just a. I don't know, a fucking lie that Todd made up for the it sake of his tough. attention, yeah. right? A lot of dudes that steal <clears throat> valor, it's just... Uh, yeah, fuck. he had no... Mil- nothing. There's nothing there. There's he, prison he wanted time. To, he That's wanted all to puff his chest like I'm some, some, something special, this Todd Dad, fucking... Yeah. Lip yeah. ass walrus, stolen valor, <laughs> no hep. Bow down to the Todd. Fuck you, Todd. So this was the big case that finally put Todd Colehep behind bars. But as authorities continued speaking with him, they would discover that the rabbit hole of Todd's life was far deeper. <laughs> the rabbit and- <laughs> hole of Todd. <laughs> and sorry to any listeners out there named Todd, but Ugh. Todd's getting... Okay, you're getting yeah. In, yeah. So it was far deeper and darker and more evil than they could ever have imagined. Rabbit hole of Todd. <laughs> First of all, shortly after being taken into custody, Todd would lead police to a site on his property where two more corpses were found. Hmm. Yeah. Authorities were shocked to unearth Johnny Coxey and his wife, Megan McCraw Coxey. He uh, led them to it. Yeah. Oh, he's just like, check this yeah. out. Yeah. This is, oh yeah, this is, this is his big scene. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This, this is, is his moment. Mm-hmm. So these, this was a young couple who had been missing since December of 2015. Autopsies on the bodies revealed that Megan had died from a gunshot wound to the head while her husband received a fatal wound to the torso. But to make matters even worse, while it was determined that Johnny had been killed immediately, Megan had been kept alive for six days before Todd had brutally murdered her on Christmas. Before or after present. So upon further Fuck research, you. it appears Megan and Johnny had just been released from jail shortly before they went missing. Okay. And with various sources reporting... Uh, through research that they had a history of panhandling and that their baby had tested positive for heroin. Ah, fuck. You kind of get the feeling that Todd specifically preyed upon people that he knew were in a bad place in life and maybe even particularly vulnerable. Right. Now, Megan and Johnny may have had problems of their own, but of course, when Todd told the story of how they died, he framed it in a way that made him look like the good guy. In the situation. Like a good narcissist. Well, sort of. Todd gave investigators his play-by-play in his confession. So in this, uh, this this portion I got from video, the actual confession tapes Mm -hmm. of Todd Kolhep. And he's sitting in front of the police officers and he's in his oranges, you know, orange Mm -hmm. clothing. And he's confessing. So he's sitting in custody and this is an excerpt from the transcript. Police. You pick them up at Blackstock and Regal Road. Is that what you said? And then tell us from the start. Todd begins. Now, one thing you'll notice, Todd is a blowhard. Yeah, he doesn't He never fucking stops talking. (laughs) So it was great to transcribe this. All I had to do was listen to Todd and just fucking type. Mm. So Todd, quote, I met her there, got her number. We talked on the phone for a brief moment. Then I met them later on that day next to Ricky's Hot Dogs, the big, huge parking lot. They walked across and spoke to me there. I almost thought she was going to hit on me to actually get it on in the car. I mean, come on. That's not what I was there for. Yikes. I'll tell you, our meeting was shady as shit. Basically, offered her the job, offered to let him go in and do it, and he could do the work as well. The next day, she was... Me, me, me. I got to interject. I'm sorry. (laughs) This motherfucker... Already. From now on, when this guy walks into the scene... (laughs) You just got to hear that song that's going on when Johnny LaRusso's fighting <laughs> fucking, uh, you know, the credit kid thing. You're the best around. Nothing's going to ever let to them. He's the best around. Because that's got to be going through his head to, to oh, act. Oh, God. To be like, I, she probably wanted to fuck me right there. I was pretty that sure he, she wanted to fuck me. Yeah. I'm the best around. <laughs> All she wants to do is suck my cock. <laughs> no. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> I know I ruined that their sentence, but... uh. The next day she was, or this was over the next several days, the next day she was in the paper, her mugshot. I guess you guys had her arrested for meth or some shit. I don't know. Something was in her bloodstream and you took her kids away. 
I asked her about it and she informed me that, yeah, she had drug issues and would that I was still going to give him a chance. You know, I get shit happens to people. It's hard. I get it. And I picked them up and I drove them to my land to get supplies. And I got them down to my building. And that's when Johnny pulled a knife out and and the police interjected. You shot him. Todd says, yes, I shot him. Police said, what'd you do with his knife? Todd, I don't know. I don't keep that kind of crap. (laughs) Because I'm the best. (laughs) And the police, you just threw it out? Yeah, yeah, I threw it out. The police. Okay, I, what did she do when you shot Johnny? What did she do when Johnny pulled the knife out? What did she say? Todd, nothing. Nothing. Police, so you think she was planning, like, in on the planning of this? Todd, I think she was entirely in on the planning of it. I'm gonna rob him. There was there was no bullshit, no Johnny, what are you doing? There's none of that. This was her actions were she knew he was doing that. They saw a guy who had a shitload of money driving a car they can't afford. They didn't even have a car, and they were gonna get something from me. Police. So then you shot him how many times? Shot him twice in the chest. Okay. And he dropped forward. And when he dropped forward, I went around him and put another one through his spinal column. Fuck. The police, okay, and you shot her? Todd, not exactly. (laughs) Okay. Uh. Right, so do you believe his series of events here? Do you believe his rendition? That they were going to rob him? Right. That's That's what he's implying. That's what he's trying to imply, So to me, it seems like he could have easily done the exact same thing to this couple as he did to Kayla and Charles. Right. That's what I think. But just, this is the first one. So yeah. maybe this is what gave him. He's like, oh, that was fun. Right. It so just attack him unprovoked in order to keep the female party to himself. That's what I think. Yeah, I agree. Um, even the way he tells the story seems like an excuse to humble brag about how much money he has. After all the heartless crimes Todd has committed against innocent people, I just don't know if I can buy this. Right. I, I really don't. But it is true that Megan and Johnny had a sketchy record. So it's possible. They may have tried something. Yeah. Either way, I really doubt that Todd was very upset when he got the opportunity to kill. I just don't think he... I thought he was probably pretty excited about it. Dim shit. So next, Todd goes on some random tangents about his property and the storage container was never supposed to be used for such gruesome purposes, which is pretty bizarre to ruminate on after everything he's done right it's like i was gonna have cool things in there i was i had a train set that i had it envisioned oh yeah so instead i had to turn it into a sex dungeon where i had to cut people up and shit Fuck. right right okay. so this is another quote the Poor con- me the name of the the shipping container was called a conex okay so he says the conex was not meant to be a cage he's right all that chain shit that was after the fact the Connex was, de- was designed for my food and my weapons and to secure my four-wheeler before I had the building built. That back area that's all wood, that wasn't designed for them. That was designed for my stuff. Kind of indignant. Okay? Until last week, there was no ceiling on that. I put that on there because she was cold. Kayla was cold, so I put it on. Aww. I went down to the Connex. He's the best. The- <laughs> <laughs> I went down to the Connex, cleaned out the back area because I had all my shit in there and at one time those ammo racks they weren't even there the ammo rack was here and here pistol rifle and then i had chain around there's a lot of chain in the building i use chain for all kinds of shit there's chain in the woods where i've got trees (laughs) where come alongs are that you know the sort the trees sort of lean towards my fence and i'll put a chain around it and hook a come along to it and then start working it this way and over a period of time it'll fall away from the fence oh fuck so chain and cable and that kind of stuff i got lots of that are the police officers just like twitching they're like god i want they're the looks on their faces here's my badge here's my gun i quit i'm gonna just let me at them oh so that okay so there were two officers in this interrogation one was leaning back and they're doing the good cop bad cop thing Mm -hmm. they're both being good at this point you know one doesn't really say much the other one's asking the questions start turning red or what and they're just sitting there there's they're blank their expressions are completely blank but they're both still just listening and the one guy he's has to write this whole thing i just love the okay yeah (laughs) after this outlandish thing it's like okay Right. So, okay. <laughs> then the look. lizard people came out of my butt. <laughs> okay, Todd. <laughs> so let's take a moment. Todd is obviously very proud of all of his gear, and he clearly has kidnapping down to a science. But before we go any further with Megan's story, you need to see the backstory of all his equipment. And it's actually probably the most bizarre thing yeah. about this entire case the Amazon reviews. Mm. Yeah, that's right. Yep. So when investigators looked into Todd's internet activity, they discovered something absolutely fucking insane. (laughs) 
Todd had been buying the tools for his crimes out in the open on Amazon, and he left public reviews where he described exactly what he was using them for. The cr- the cr- so the crazy part is, anybody who read these creepy reviews probably laughed it off as just some dark humor. Yeah, inconceivable that anybody would fucking ever right. think that it was, oh, that's guy, that guy's killing people. Oh, so get you this. just don't think about it. Right, so on a, on a master padlock review, the review read, quote, solid locks. Have five on a shipping container. Won't stop them, but sure will slow them down till they're too old to care. Yeah, on a, on a fixed blade. Haven't stabbed anyone yet. Yet. But I'm keeping the dream alive, and when I do, it will be with a quality tool like this. Mm. On another master lock. Works great. Also, if someone talks back, go old school on them by putting this in a sock and beating them. They will not appreciate the hardened steel like you will. Works great on a shipping container. Jesus yep. fuck. Portable shovel. Keep in your car from when you have to hide the bodies. And you left the full size shovel at home. Doesn't come with a midget. Sure would have been nice. Oh, what a cunt. Yep. A Husqvarna chainsaw. Works excellent. Getting the neighbor to stand still while you chase him with it is hard enough without having an easy to use chainsaw. Fucking what? Dear Amazon, I love my toothbrush. I kill people with it every day. Ha ha ha. It's like killing cavities, but people are cavities. Ha 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 ha. On some travel case item, it's blacker than my soul and priced right. <laughs> These reviews. Wow. There was even a padlock review that read, now my locks have locks. Place is Hotel California now. You know, with these modern serial <clears throat> killers, uh, you know, 21st century guys, mm-hmm. I would it would be terrible to see, but it would be very interesting to know their internet history, to see what kind of shit, where they find themselves on the yeah. internet. You know, just how dark they end up going into it. Because a lot of us are dark, and we all spend time on the internet in places that we're probably mm-hmm. like, ew, I need a shower. But right. I wonder, because this guy, this, I would, it'd be interesting to see what, it'd be interesting to see what entertains this guy, mm-hmm. or what, what he does in his dark times. Well, it seems like Todd was a big fan of Hotel California. He just, sat in, his, he just sat in his fucking yeah. giant house. And over just, and over. Living it up. <laughs> <laughs> so what would you have thought if you saw these Amazon reviews? I'm just curious. Would you have been concerned or would you no. have just brushed it off? I would brush it off. Yeah, me too. I mean, I'm... I, uh, maybe not now, but before this, I would have been like, okay. Yeah. You know, I would well, have been I mean, like, I spent so I much time like, on LiveLeak, I, yeah. you know, and those kind of places, and, and I've been on Reddit a, a plenty of times that I think I'm totally desensitized to that. And yeah. really, I would have, not knowing what I know about him, mm-hmm. I would have been like, that's pretty funny. Mm. And that's the well, truth. either way, all of Todd's refuse just further demonstrate how smart and funny he really thinks he is, and how he wanted to brag about his crimes, even if he had to do it in this weird roundabout way. If so, he wasn't a serial killer, those would have been kind of funny. <laughs> But the fact that he is a serial killer, that's obviously not funny. <clears throat> so, still kind of funny, but not, not funny. Well, moving forward with Todd's 2015 crime, the next part was very disturbing and disgusting. As Todd describes how he decided what to do with Megan. Mm-hmm. It really feels like he views his victims as nothing more than objects which he can dispose of whenever it gets inconvenient for him. Psycho. So here's another quote. Todd, quote, I didn't know what to do with her, man. One side, I really wanted to drop her. Next side, I really, I don't know, I kind of wanted to save her ass. The police. Let me back up real quick before we go that far, because we're talking about Johnny, the girl who was with Johnny. Did you shoot her? Todd, not at that time. Okay, the police said. What happened to her? Todd, she panicked, but then she said, I told her to sit down, and she sat down. I went ahead and cuffed her, patted her down, told her I wasn't going to hurt her, and she calmed down. And I actually took her to the Connex. Wait, no, no, that's not true. I had her lay there for a while because I didn't know what I was going to do with her. I didn't want her in my Connex because I had stuff in there and I didn't know what the hell to do with it. Putting her in with my guns was not a good move. (laughs) Actually had to go for the first time ever. I was having a little bit of a panic about what the hell do I do with her? Put her here, put her there, drop her. What the hell do I do? Do I call the cops? Oh shit, I've got illegal guns. I told her I wasn't going to touch her, I wasn't going to rape her, wasn't going to do anything to her. Just told her to calm the hell down and let me sort this shit out. Somewhere between when I did that and when I shot him was at the back, tight in the back, tight in the back. He had to, you know, point that out. Mm. Got to calm her down and kept coming back and forth trying to figure out what to do. But I had her cuffed and she wasn't going anywhere. Eventually, I went and once I got her on that floor for a while... I left her on that floor cuffed because I didn't know what the hell to do with her. I didn't want her in the building. I got the tractor, got it out with hair, 
picked up the body and was trying to figure out what the hell to do with it. The police. This is Johnny's body? Todd. Yeah, like I said, I was having a little meltdown. Okay, dude just doesn't... First of all, he talks in circles. His, his priorities of what meltdowns and mental issues are are pretty, yeah. pretty strange. He yeah. talks in circles. He's killing re- the people. That's he the repeats meltdown. himself. Uh, it's just... And transcribing this was hard. I cut some of it because it was just repetition, mm, you know? Of course. But even still, there's a lot of repetition in here. Mm. So it was at this point that Todd goes off on a tangent. Oh, big surprise. <laughs> on how He's much... The best. <laughs> about how much more concerned he is about losing his sanctuary than he is about murdering people. So another quote from Todd. The land was supposed to be my sanctuary, not my killing field. And then he laughed. Fuck you, Todd. This is not meant to be my killing field. It was supposed to be a place where I can go and relax and get away from people and not deal with all this bullshit. This killing really bothered me because it was such needless shit. Hell, I was given a money. Why are you why are you robbing me? He says he thinks his violence is all needless and stupid, which is pretty ironic considering all the people he's killed out of petty personal grudges. Mm -hmm. Uh, You'll see what I mean soon enough. It was all about what works for Todd. He goes on to nonchalantly describe burying Johnny saying, quote, was a lot more work than you think. Then he wasn't sure what to do with Megan. Okay, so I have another quote here from Todd. Quote, I tied her up, left her there while I tried to figure out what to do. I didn't know what to do with her, man. Got rid of Johnny, came back, left her there, went and got food. I fed the girl, the police. You fed her after she tried to rob you? Todd, well, yeah, what are you going to do with her? I didn't want to shoot her. I mean, I can't hear some crazy batshit woman going back to, I mean, she's going bipolar left and right. I wouldn't, she wouldn't calm down. Well, she did finally calm down, but she, she was talking to me and first she had drug issues and then she kept going off the deep end with weird shit and kept talking and then she kept telling me she had manic mode or some sort of bipolar lithium crap i don't know what the hell it was where she was up and down up and down up and down she didn't mellow out like kayla did she did finally calm down but she wasn't upset and the police what made you decide to shoot her todd i'll get to that (laughs) Fuck, man. Right. Okay, so it's clear from the way Todd tells this story, almost with a sort of excitement, that he has no remorse. And that's one of the things that really was infuriating to me time and time again. Well, well, think of it like this, though. It's very likely this person was born this way. I don't don't care. And they can't help it. I don't care. This is who they, they are, and they just have to be kept. We need to figure that kind of stuff out in the future perhaps but they'll just that means they're taking babies away and throwing them in islands and shit and i'm not for that either but right whatever so e- even <laughs> here luck, people were fucked when the investigator tries to get him to cut to the chase and tell him why he shot megan he just says i'll get to that like it's some juicy drama has been done dying to share right. it's just i can't shell annoying. i can't tell you the punchline i yeah. can't tell you the climax yet. so then he complains about all the stuff he bought for megan while keeping her captive hmm. todd quote I wasn't going to shoot her. I was going to give her money. I don't know why the hell she went the hell off. I held her. I hate the kidnapping part, but I, of course I did another one. I held her there for a couple of days. Police, how many days? Five or six? Every damn day she wanted Little Caesar's pizza. I hate that shit. It always gives me heartburn. Oh, fuck you, Todd. Little Caesar's pizza, Mountain Dew. Wait, no, not Mountain Dew. It was Dr. Pepper. Cinnamon rolls and friggin' Newports. If you go down to my building, you'll find an unused package of Newports I bought for her. And then she went batshit. She took, she tried to light my building on fire. Police, quote, in back of what building? Todd, the Connex. Okay, so we get to this part of the interrogation and it gets kind of weird. While telling the investigators where they can find the cigarettes he bought for Megan in the storage container, he says something creepy and totally unprompted. Because Todd's a dipshit. So, Todd, oh, yeah, there's a collar in there. Okay. That collar was Kayla's. The police, a neck collar? Todd, yeah, she had me order it. Say what now? And the police, she asked you to order it? And Todd, yes, sir. Didn't use it on her because it came in the mail and I looked at it and I was like, oh, okay, that shit's too kinky for me. It's a stainless steel collar with like hooks for putting like locks on. And then he laughs. I mean, dude, it's like having your, I don't even treat my dogs that way. End quote. 
Okay, so let me explain the backstory for this one because it's really weird and I was very confused at first too. You have to wonder if you left a review for that. Dear Amazon, I'm a piece of shit killer, but I bought this neck thing and it's just too much for me. Not like that shunts player I bought three months ago. That was great. Five stars. Todd actually claimed that Kayla had been writing letters to him while she was in captivity asking for sex. Yeah, I doubt that pretty highly. With Todd himself even telling a reporter, I'm not saying she's not a victim. I'm saying she's not the victim she portrays what the fuck Todd? right right i mean she turned into 50 shades of gray with bodies i hope this guy, end quote I, this is what i'm hoping right now he's still alive he's in prison uh, i hope he's i'm the best around todd in uh, prison and i hope it's it's lovely for him because uh, people i don't think put up with that even in the criminal world they're like somebody needs to kick todd's ass so I, I, you know. I i'm guessing that's where the supposed caller comes in it was at this time that Todd Kohlhepp says he will admit to everything he's done. He'll even take responsibility uh, as to the kidnapping, but he will not take responsibility for rape because he did not rape her. What the That's, fuck does he think he did? Right. Todd states well, that he any... He thinks that she was yeah, wanting he's, him from afar. He states that any time they had sex, it was completely consensual. She had the choice and she actually initiated it at times. This is what Todd's saying. Todd also states that Kayla sent him on shopping sprees. She had him buy her a vibrator, a TV, a DVD player, an MP3 player, and adult coloring books. Shopping spree. Yeah. So when the police seemed surprised, Todd responded with, quote, dude, I didn't question. I just, I just, it got her to shut up and got her to roll over. And then he laughed. Dude. Yeah. So he's talking about it like it's his wife that's yep. chained to the wall. Exactly. So referencing it's just normal, normal wife stuff. Referencing a, a bag or like a small suitcase that they found in their search of the shipping container hidden behind the bed, the police asked him if he'd ever spent the night with her in the bed. Todd stated that he never spent the whole night, although he did spend a lot of time on the bed. Just smelling his own farts. Then he goes on to reference a large pet bed that was on the floor next to the mattress. Todd quote that was her idea that was her submissive kitty bed okay. her kitty bed mm. man it threw me off all of a sudden i put the collar thing on her i ordered off one of those websites that delivered and i got it because she requested that as opposed to me putting a chain around her neck and i got that and i said no i went that ain't gonna going on anybody but the chains are good. but she wanted that and then the kitty bed and she went into this whole thing of explaining to me that i had to give her permission to speak to me i had to give her permission to look at me Dude, I don't do all that shit. She had all this stuff. She kept asking for this stuff, and I got it. Everything she wanted. Then she wanted this big black book. It was like $23 for that damn book. And it's the enchanted sorcerer or sorcery shit. I don't know. It's a how-to guide to how to be a witch. She was going to put a hex on Todd. Dude, I just was figuring she'd read the damn book and shut the fuck up for a while. Fuck you, Todd. Yeah, Todd. Mm. You're a real charmer. Yeah, he's a great guy. Yep. He's certain of it. So Todd goes on to state that Kayla also asked him to track down and beat people up for her or to use his resources, quote unquote, uh, which she thinks he says she thinks my resources are to get someone killed. Well, he's he's bragging about yeah. being a former killer for the oh, government, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. So Todd, quote, I believe she wanted him beat up, but she wanted to use my resources to have him offed or for me to go do it myself. Kayla uses that thing between her legs to get dumbasses to go do stupid shit. End quote. Wow. What a piece of fucking work. Yeah, mental gymnastics. Wow. Okay, so yeah, I'm just going to leave it at that out of respect for the victim. But I couldn't find any of those letters or anything, anything to suggest that Kayla was there consensually. What I will say is that even if such letters existed, who's to say that Kayla wasn't just appealing to Todd's ego exactly. to stay in his good graces and to save her own fucking life? Right. She just watched somebody exactly. that she cared about killed and then right. nonchalantly buried. Yeah. After all, she herself even stated, I realized it was easier if he thought things were going his way. So I made him think whatever I had to. Good for you, Kayla. Yeah. Good for you. It saved your life. It did. Plus, Todd had reportedly warned Kayla that there was a woman who he'd kidnapped before who hadn't been so lucky to make it out with her life, which brings us back to Megan. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go back to Megan. Okay. Unsurprisingly, Todd said a gross and totally unnecessary sexual remark about Megan, too, during his confession. It was completely unprompted. I think we see the pattern. Quote, 
told her basically that if she would just chill the hell out, oh, yeah. you don't know me, you don't know very much about me, you don't have shit on me either. And the last time I checked from what was online, she had a warrant really looking for her ass. I'll give you any of the $4,000. I'll drive you to damn Tennessee. I'll drop your ass off somewhere. And if you've got any common sense on this planet, you'll go left and I'll go right. And the police. And what did she say? Todd. Oh, she got excited. I got my dick sucked. Fuck you. And it wasn't bad either. Todd. I told her I'd give her $4,000 and basically release her in Tennessee. Just go. Please go and don't come back. Yeah, I don't buy that. He killed this woman. Yeah, yeah. And it wasn't bad either. Yeah. yeah. Fucking cocky motherfucker. Yeah. It's fucking cringy and horribly sickening at, the, sickening at the same time to hear him talk so proudly about these That's things. disgusting. So it's like he thinks the investigators are his buddies, mm -hmm. which just goes to show how large his ego truly is. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just dumb. dumb. Here he goes on to say that he thought his plan to set Megan free would work since she didn't really even know who he was. And basically, because of her sketchy background, she probably wouldn't want to go in law to law enforcement for help uh, he was assuming that she wasn't going to go to the cops but somewhere along the line Todd changed his mind the police asked him what it was that changed his mind what what made that change what happened what do you mean what made what change the police well she ended up dead Todd oh you mean what that why that makes sense okay oh the reason you asked me the question okay I wanted to get rid of her the weather went to shit it was right before Christmas man we were either having sleet, we were having rain, the weather just went to shit. And the I weather? Yeah. Jesus. And I still had to find a way to get away from Ashley, my girlfriend, long enough to get out of work, to get this person to Tennessee, drop her off, and then get home. And that's not a that's not a couple hour trip. And if I'm dropping her, it ain't gonna be at the border. We're going to Nashville. I want her all the way a hell, the hell away from me. If she was gonna tell you, she was happy. Mm. She was happy as hell for like two days. No, I doubt that. She was happy as hell. I just couldn't get past the weather. Fuck you, Todd. The last day I went over there, I opened the Connex box. She burned up half the friggin' building. I mean, she took my ammo racks, grabbed them, and tore them apart. I'm going to tell you for such a tiny little bitch, like, damn, wow. and the police. So then what happened? Todd, quote, well, there was ammo and stuff everywhere, and she broke the fan. Yeah, I bought her a fan. She, and then she broke the fan. Prime, man, you just can't beat that shit. Two-day shipping. He said that? There's a pin in there now, and it came with a two-pack, so I actually had two. What a fucking crazy person. I got her those to get air ventilation. I got lanterns for her, too, so she had light. I did the best I could to make it somewhat livable. Mm -hmm. I got her blankets and I got her pillows. She went and lit the whole damn thing on fire. I'm surprised she didn't asphyxiate. When I went into the building, I mean, I was choking. I went to get her out and then all of a sudden, it's like I had a caged animal on my hands. I don't know, what the hell? I was like, what the hell? She went from so friggin' happy in the world to be, I'm gonna go to Tennessee with money, and I'm gonna restart my life, and thank you, thank you, thank you, to batshit crazy. Yeah, perplexing. Um, you think? Uh, the, maybe the chains. She's and, held captive. Yeah, I can. <laughs> yeah, but she had a fan. I mean, she should right. have been happy, well, right? Hit, two fans, really. If the other mm, one broke, there right. was a backup fan. So. At Prime. that point, I tried to walk her out of the building. I just had enough. I walked her outside. I was trying to calm down, figure out what the hell to do with her. And I came back in the building, and she was going nuts. And it wasn't like she was emotional about the situation. It had been days. It wasn't so much about that. It was like the serious chemical imbalance shit. And she walked outside, and I walked her outside, and then I put a bullet in the back of her head. Then I had a salad because I'm a psycho. In the police. What gun did you shoot her with, Todd? That same one. That you shot Johnny with? Police. And that was a Glock? Yes. And that was the same one you shot Charlie with? Todd. And it wasn't my favorite gun. It's just, I don't know, it's a handy gun. And it's very effective. So you could, so you could shoot 180 range. Wasn't my best End gun. End quote. Right. What? <sighs> Fuck. Okay. So... Sadly, that's how things ended for Megan. Oh, fuck. What a crazy yeah. motherfucker this guy is. Todd's temper got out of control, and just like that, Mr. Nice Guy was no more. Mr. Nice Guy that never was. Yeah. Later on, a former co-worker of Megan actually revealed that the victim had met Todd while working at her Waffle House job. And when authorities began digging deeper, they were told that Todd would act so creepy at the restaurant, inviting waitresses to his home and leaving large tips in a bid to get their attention, that a male cook actually started taking Todd's orders whenever he'd come in just to keep the waitresses safe 
and more comfortable. So another detail concerned about Todd's romantic life that sent a shiver down my spine is something Kayla revealed when rescued. So apparently, Todd had an ongoing relationship with a woman named Holly for about 10 years. Uh Sources say that it was an affair and that she was actually the person who paid for the storage container Kayla was trapped in. But Holly never suspected that her lover was hiding a gruesome second life from her. She had no idea. She said that he gave her a lot of attention and made her feel very important. Mm -hmm. However, when Holly found out about Kayla's kidnapping and watched the footage of her being transported to the hospital, she was left speechless when Kayla spoke about, quote, some girl named Holly he was supposedly planning to kill. Fuck. Yes. So Holly was like, what? spine. Who knows how many more victims could have fallen prey to Todd if authorities hadn't stepped in to stop him. Even Kayla could have been days or hours away from becoming another voiceless victim of Todd's unpredictable wrath. But, you know, all these stories of how creepy Todd was, while also simultaneously being a respected businessman in the area, it really caught my attention. But to understand how this masked monster was made, I had to look back on his early years. And although the unspeakable things he did even back then, left me at a loss for words. It all led up to his most brutal crime of all, a quadruple homicide, one that plagued and puzzled the community for 13 years and wasn't solved until Todd proudly confessed to the police during his investigation. It was his moment. Uh, We'll be going over that infuriating footage next, but first, you really need to understand the absolute disaster that was Todd's childhood. Todd was born in Florida in 1971, but raised in South Carolina in Georgia. He didn't have the most enjoyable childhood, as his parents' marriage was crumbling, and they were divorced when he was still a baby. Growing up, Todd reportedly loathed his stepfather and wanted to live with his biological dad, despite having seemingly no contact with him for about eight years. And because of these less than stellar circumstances, or maybe something that had always been broken within him, Todd started to behave in a very concerning way early on. Born psycho. He was violent towards other children and showed signs of severe emotional and mental instability. He would destroy classmates' property at school and was actually sent to a mental facility at the age of nine due to his sudden explosions of anger. Throughout this counseling, Todd was described as being preoccupied with sexual content at a disturbingly young age. So if you're a true crime fan, then this won't be surprising to you at all. But Todd was also known to be extremely cruel to animals as a child, often a telltale sign of a psychopath. Well, they they used to call it the trifecta or something like Mm -hmm. that, the trill, whatever. Three things. They have kind of debunked that over time. We we cover that on Time Suck a lot. But but it is really crazy just how often people do the, it's the wet the beds, play with fire, and... uh, it, there is, animals. but it's not. It, they can't actually claim it to be a, a recipe because it's not all. No, you know. And I think we've talked about this before. A lot of young, real young boys, at least from my experience, mm-hmm. they just have to figure out the world. They figure out the world by being mean to animals. Mm-hmm. The empathy, well, they learn the empathy yeah, that the, way. The, mm-hmm. That's why having cats and dogs around little kids is mm-hmm. such a rough time for the animal. So not only did he heartlessly shoot a dog with a BB gun, but he also killed a goldfish with Clorox. Because he wanted a gerbil instead. Right. They, you yeah. told me this story before. Yeah. So his, in a quick nutshell, he had a, a goldfish and he asked for a gerbil. And his mom said, well, you already have a goldfish. And Normal he, parent shit. Yeah. yeah. He, he said, but I, I don't want the goldfish anymore. And she said, well, we'll get you a gerbil once the goldfish passes on. And that was the mistake. Yeah. yeah. He dumped, he filled the goldfish bowl with Clorox. And then she was like, what the, f- what the hell? <laughs> and he said, well, it's dead now. Can I have a gerbil? Gerbil time. Yeah. Ugh. And he went through a dozen animals that summer. He even locked another boy in a dog crate and rolled the crate around while laughing until the t- child was in tears and begging him to stop. I think I did that to my poor cousin once. Todd's father would later share that the only emotion his son was capable of was anger. His mother must have been well aware of this as well because later she described locking him in his room at night and placing locks on her own bedroom door just in case he decided to try anything. Oh, fuck. Good night, my little Todd Pole. Good night, Mom. Don't let the bed bugs bite. I'll kill them all, Mom. Yeah, sweet dreams, my little demon. See you soon, Mom. No, please stay in the bed. Please do not get out of the bed. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, so she also said he stabbed a little girl on the school bus in the leg with scissors to get back at her. Yikes. 
He destroyed a bunch of new furniture his mom had bought him with a hammer and even threatened to kill her. I am shocked. Still, in 1983, Todd got his wish of reuniting with his biological father after purportedly threatening to kill himself otherwise. But this ended up being just another bad influence on Todd, as the man apparently taught the boy how to blow things up. Well, that's obviously the next thing you'd want to do. Now, your mom tells me you're a real psychopath. Yeah, I'll fucking kill you. Yeah, mean to animals. Fuck animals. I stabbed a little girl in the leg with some scissors. She deserved it. Well, it's obvious that you and I need to have a man-to-man talk. Hmm? Have you ever heard of a pipe bomb? Hmm. Despite bonding over shared interests, <laughs> living with his father didn't play out like Todd had dreamed it would. The man's frequent absence due to his many girlfriends left Todd thinking it would be better to return to his mother, but at this point, she made excuses to prevent this. I don't blame her. In October 1986, Todd was still in Arizona living with his dad when his violent tendencies would extend to a new extreme. And here we go. Hmm. He was only 15 years old, but he managed to lure a 14-year-old neighbor girl who he had a crush on out of her home by saying her boyfriend wanted to speak to her at his house. He then held a gun to her head, brought her home, tied her hands up with a rope, taped her mouth shut, and sexually assaulted her. After this, he walked her home and threatened her not to tell anyone what had just happened or else he'd kill her little brother and sister. Luckily, somebody ultimately did call the police, and when Todd was apprehended, the first thing he had to say was, quote, how much time am I going to get for this? End quote. Yeah, so 15 already way into being a psycho. Yep, so Born and, a psycho. And get this, Todd explained that his motive for the disgusting crime had been because he had a, he was mad at his father, who was out of town, and he wanted to rebel. Oh. Yeah. Okay. At, so at this time, he was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. Borderline, okay. huh? Yeah. So, okay, now I want to take a brief moment to touch on Todd's late mother, because some of the things she said about her son's behavior are a bit odd to me. Okay. So before he was sentenced for this crime, she wrote to an adult probation officer pleading for leniency on Todd. According to Greenville News, she claimed that the incident had brought her and her son closer together as she wrote, as he wrote her frequently while in jail, musing, you know, quote, you know, it's strange. Maybe a little good does come from some bad. She also wrote, they don't stop to think that he even walked the girl home. Does that sound like a dangerous criminal? Yes. He even walked the girl Sadistic home. Sadistic fuck. End yes. quote. He's still my good boy. While she may have had decent intentions, I feel like a statement like this would be a slap in the face to the teenage victim and her family. Absolutely. And I'm sure that it was. Yeah. Ultimately, it was recommended that Todd be tried as an adult. Tried as a psycho. With one neighbor even describing him as a devil on a chain. Sounds like it. So here's what I find really interesting. When evaluated, Todd was found to show deep emotional disturbance but not psychosis. Mm -hmm. This would seem to suggest that Todd was not, in fact, out of touch with reality, which makes his detached behavior that much more chilling. Well, overall, the psychiatrist determined that Todd had an inflated ego and was extremely rebellious towards authority. Todd's the best uh, around. Someone who, quote, generally feels like he should be in control. And there's one other key element that might play an underlying role in all of these big ideas Todd holds about himself. His IQ. When tested, Todd was found to have an above average IQ of 118. Calm down, Todd. Although, interestingly, his high school teacher reported poor academic performance, so he didn't get very good grades. Right. It seems to me like Todd just felt like he was better than everyone else, and he was above the rest of the crowd, and rather than apply his intelligence towards positive goals, he used it to manipulate people and orchestrate his heinous crimes. That's just my opinion. Hmm. Um... In this case, even the juvenile probation officer would end up recommending adult incarceration (laughs) as he didn't think that Todd's deep-seated issues could be solved easily and Todd agreed to plead guilty to kidnapping in exchange for the sexual assault charges to be dropped. See, I don't know. Uh, He was born bad and you got to recognize that. I I am not giving this man any excuses. No, no, I'm not giving him excuses. I'm I'm saying maybe an island for born bad. So... If and they get to go fight it out like that movie with Ray Liotta that nobody ever watched. <laughs> no escape. Good fucking movie. 
So if this is infuriating to you, you're not alone, as one probation officer went so far as to say that this was a travesty of justice. Yeah, it really sounds like it was. Another official declared that Todd had little to no conscience and presented the greatest risk to the community. It appeared that Todd believed the world owed him something. Yeah. Very few held hope that he would be rehabilitated at all. And they were right. Well, as much as we can wish someone had locked Todd up for longer so he couldn't hurt anyone else, that wasn't the case. Right. So, unfortunately, he only received a 15-year sentence. And when he got out, when he was 30 years old, he moved back to South Carolina and was placed on the sex offender registry. Victory, right? Yeah. However, interestingly, while incarcerated, Todd had only been cited for violent behavior in the first few years of his stay, but throughout his 20s, he had no other records of disobedience, almost like Todd had learned how to put on a friendly act Mm -hmm. in order to get what he wanted. No way. Huh. That's what narcissists do. Upon release, Todd hit the ground running, paving a new life for himself. He had earned a bachelor's degree in computer science while in prison, and in 2002, he got a job as a graphic designer for a sports apparel company. Todd went on to get another degree in business administration marketing, and in 2006, he applied to receive a real estate license. This is where I was blown away, Mm -hmm. because they really dig in. You have to be a somewhat stellar person to receive a real estate license. Become a real tall. But there was, like here, there was one little problem. Applicants were required to explain any history of criminal convictions in order to obtain their license. Mm -hmm. However... Todd had a clever plan. He twisted things to sound way better for him than the reality. He painted it as a petty argument between his teenage self and his girlfriend, saying they broke up and that her dog got loose. And then when they went to look for it, the girl's parents got worried and called the police. He said the only reason he had a gun was due to concerns over gangs in the Phoenix area and that the kidnapping charge was due to him telling her, quote, not to move while they talked this out, end quote. So yeah, just a complete lie, Hmm. but a very deliberate one, which fit all the parameters that would reasonably explain his charges without revealing the awful, ugly crime he actually committed. Yeah, but he got 15 years. Yeah. Well, this is... They're they're not going to give you like, oh, the dog got away and oh, you just hold hold steady. Well, unless they dig into his charges and find out how much jail time he actually served. I mean, they Hmm. have to pull that up. He didn't want to share that. True. Well, I guess this lie worked out for Todd, and after getting his bearings in the real estate scene, he even started his own business called TKA Real Estate, which employed about a dozen agents. His career was booming, and on the surface, he seemed like a pretty charismatic, hardworking guy to those around him. But still, his darker side leaked through the cracks at times, and people started to take notice. Coworkers were very uncomfortable with how he would casually watch inappropriate uh, adult adult oh. videos at work for hours. Yeah, Todd, we all want you to yeah. know it's not okay oh, yeah. for you to watch donkey porn marathons yeah, yeah, in the yeah, office. Just a minute, just you know, a minute. the HR director is going to have to hear about this eventually. Right? He's that guy. And someone okay. and some women felt uneasy at the sexual innuendos he made to them. Oh, yeah. I bet. I you bet. think? I bet it was awful. He even made a distasteful joke on his firm's website that he motivated his workers by not feeding them. <laughs> Apparently, he was very open about his status as a sex offender but would claim the charges stemmed from a girl's dad getting mad and overreacting over the teens when they took a joyride together. Hmm. So that was his excuse publicly. Again, very far from the truth. But at the same time, Todd had glowing reviews. He was described by many associates as very personable and even got recognized as a top-selling rookie agent in his region at one point. So all in all, his strange habits and unusual quirks were just chalked up to... Well, just that. So it wouldn't be until 2016 and his confession that authorities would find out about a brutal and high-profile quadruple homicide that they've been struggling to solve since 2003 had been all Todd's doing. Mm. So now let's talk about the Superbikes incident. Yeah, this is crazy. We told you Todd was a dipshit. It was a warm afternoon in November 2003, Spartanburg County, when an unsuspecting customer walked into the store, Superbike Motorsports, only to be faced with a horrifying, gruesome scene. All the employees staffing the shop had been shot to death. Terrified, the customer quickly called the police, who hurried over to inspect the bloodbath. The victims were quickly identified as the shop's owner, his mother, and two young co-workers. 
But as much as their devastated loved ones grieved and hoped for justice, the killer behind such an audacious and reckless shooting somehow managed to slip through the cracks. And as the years went by and authorities racked their brains fruitlessly for answers, going down a few dead ends in the process, they had no idea that the real monster behind this notorious unsolved crime was hiding right under their noses the whole time as a respected member of their community. So, in this 2016 interrogation, they're finding out the full extent of what really happened that day at the motor shop, and the real motive was probably the last thing they ever expected. And he just fucking decided to say it, because he felt like, this is my moment. This is his moment. uh, Yeah, he's caught, so he may as well talk about everything. Well... Yeah, he... Well, one murder gets you pretty much your life's done. Right. So he's like, fuck it. I'm going to add my all of them. So this is another one where I transcribed the interrogation. And I did this uh, on purpose, a lot of transcription, because you have to get the feel for this guy. Mm -hmm. And if I paraphrased, you're not getting his words. No, I like what you did this Uh, way. I I dislike this man more because I've heard his own words. So this is a direct quotes. Police. The policeman. So go ahead. You bought the bike. Todd. Yes, I bought the bike. Tried to ride it and it didn't work anyway. Key points. Had it 14 days and it got stolen from the front of the apartment complex. Before it got stolen, I had gone back to them a few days prior to it being stolen and told them that I was having a hard time riding it and I was not so sure I'd made a wise decision. Police. Okay. And you went back to them because you were inexperienced. And what else did you say? (laughs) <laughs> Todd, quote, I thought it was a bad decision. I was trying to see if I could possibly trade it in for a smaller bike or something of that nature. Maybe I just, I, I didn't know how to ride it. They were, please understand that this was many, many years ago. They proceeded to give me, well, the rude side about my inability to ride that kind of bike. No one ever taught me. So, I mean, I didn't know how to operate the clutch and the possibility they could rebuy it sometime with a new trailer. Maybe by then, to make up my mind, they had just dropped it off at the apartment. So they knew. They knew exactly where it was stored because the guy brought it over to me. Police. So you said they knew where it was stored. Todd. They knew exactly where it was stored because they dropped it off there. Two, three days later, it came up missing. There was a police report, and as far as I know, they never found the bike. To me, it's pretty obvious that Todd's anger stems from being, him being pissed off at what he saw was the employees looking down on him, and for some reason, that seemed to be the one thing Todd can't tolerate. Also, the fact that he wasn't good at something. Yeah. And I don't think narcissists accept that shit well. Like, well, like he walked in there thinking, just give me the nice bike, that one there. And then they're like, yeah, that's you got to know how to ride it. And he's yeah. like, fuck you. Right. I'm me. I'm Todd. Yeah. I'm the best. <laughs> <laughs> So during his confession, he gets sidetracked again and complains about the police not taking him seriously when he reported the motorcycle theft. He stated that the officer made fun of him while writing the report. Mm. Todd stated the officer told him that it was a shame it had gotten stolen before he got a chance to write Todd a ticket. He said that was the one time that he didn't like the police. Mm. Todd says a little while after that incident, he cooled down. He was once again making visits to the motorcycle shop. According to Todd, during one of his visits, he was sitting on a bike and the manager came out. Todd called him an asshole and said he was a friend of the owner's. He states he was doing his best to leave the past in the past when the manager starts making comments about the last bike being stolen. Todd thought the manager was implying that the business was the one who stole the bike. This pissed Todd off, yet over the next few weeks, he continued to visit the shop. Quote, I'm sure he was lovely. Yeah, quote, I let it slide for the time being. Got mad about it, but I kept going there. Why I kept going to the same bike place, I don't really know. Because you're a dipshit. But I'd go out there, sit on the bikes, and then I'd be listening to these two. The owner and the manager basically talk trash, end quote. I find this part so intriguing because even Todd himself admits he doesn't know why he would keep going back to the bike shop. Because he's psycho. If the employee's attitudes bothered him so much, right? I'm sure they were sick of him. Well, part of me feels like he just wanted a reason to get more and more agitated so he'd feel justified in what he was about to do, Hmm. personally. I feel like everybody that's worked in retail 
He's like, I know that fucking guy. Yeah. He comes in there. He's like, I'm going to do the dumbest shit ever. I'm going to sit right here on the bed. Mm-hmm. I'm going to sit here on this couch that you're selling. I'm going to mm-hmm. sit here in the fucking TV section at Walmart. <laughs> well, so to the workers, Todd was just some weird customer who kept coming in and acting strange. But they could never have predicted the absolutely evil plan that was simmering just below the surface. Todd, this is a quote. I bought a Beretta 92 FS. Police, a Beretta 92 Todd, yes, 92 FS, 9 millimeter. At the time, it only had 10 round mags because they had slapped a limitation, and the aftermarket pro mags were god awful. <laughs> Fuck. And the police. Only the best. <laughs> right. Todd. Police, so how many rounds? So you had a 10 round magazine? Yes, sir, three of them. Police, three 10 round magazines? Mm hmm. Although I've got quite a few of those Kydex, they work very well. Bravo concealment. I would recommend. Oh them. fuck your face, Todd. End quote. Ugh. Good fucking god. Those cops probably they probably had They're one probably at home like, and they sold it immediately. Yeah. They're like, I don't want anything. This guy recommends. <laughs> fuck he then guy. goes on to give a long-winded explanation about suppressors. Laughing, he leans back and declares that you know eventually he just made his own because Todd's a badass, right? Mm-hmm. Listening to this portion of the interview is almost funny how the investigators would just cut Todd off whenever he started to ramble on about his accomplishments. Right. Okay. They, were, they were getting sick of him, too. I feel like a big motivator for Todd was getting the recognition that he felt he deserved. So <laughs> the utter dismissals during his big moment it, to tell the story. Yeah, it was, that's some, some level of justice. It was probably kind of a letdown, you yeah. know? Yeah, exactly. It yeah. hurt him, so that's justice for for humanity. Right. Where it's like, you so, wanted this and you didn't get it, dick. Anyways. Good here, job, police officers. Here's where Todd finally tells the methodical timeline from the day of the crime. Todd, quote, I left college, I left my class, drove to Dolan Springs, put the shoulder holster on in the CVS parking lot, got there, not everybody was there yet. I went in, sat on a few bikes, did my usual, and did my best to make sure that the paying customers were not in there. Collateral damage isn't cool. Oh, what an uncool fuck. End quote. So fuck you, Todd. Todd really leans into the point that he didn't want to kill paying customers, which seems to be his way of painting himself as some sort of anti-hero. Yeah, he's like Batman. He, like, yeah, like he really seems to relish in viewing himself through that lens. He's it's Batman. so fucking annoying. Quote, Todd, quote, this was during the time, as you know, that it was not busy. I chose a time that was not after work when I would have a lot of people in there. Didn't want to shoot up people. Kind of funny. Kayla actually put in her paperwork when she was writing stuff about me that she'd found a killer with a conscience and a kidnapper with morals, whatever the hell that meant. End quote. What a fucking... What a, what a feat. Yeah, nurse, what happened to this patient? Oh, he broke his own back trying to pat himself on it. Yeah, why is his dick out? Yeah, he was also jerking himself off. What a dipshit. Dipshit. I'm great. I'm the greatest of these guys. I'm the greatest of the killers there ever was. So as Todd waited <laughs> for who he judged as innocent people to leave, he was also waiting for one of the employees who he felt wronged him to show up. Once he was alone with the workers, Todd says he asked to buy a bike so that the mechanic would take it back and prep it. And then he says one of the most outrageous things the police have probably ever heard. Okay, quote, Todd, that was one big building. Mm Mm-hmm. I cleared it in 30 seconds. The police, you what now? (laughs) Todd, I cleared that building in under 30 seconds. You guys would have been proud. Fuck you, Todd. I'm sorry, but you guys would have been proud. End Fuck quote. Fuck you, Todd. What? God damn your fucking brain, Todd. Uh, so the interrogators brush off his comment and his story continues. He says he first went to the back where the mechanic was prepping the bike. And here he even brags a little more. Todd, okay. Walked up, pulled out the Beretta, put the safety off, shot the mechanic twice. Downward angle. He was beneath me. He was down, crouched down on his side of the bike. Mike was here, I'm on this side, so I lean over the bike, and I believe it was two shots. I got him in two lung, sh- two lung shots. I got each lung. Fuck you, Todd. The uh-huh. police, you got him with lung, two lung shots. Yes, sir. If he could get up from that, I'd say I'm impressed. What End a quote. cunt. Oh, God. Right? Oh, God. <clears throat> then, unprompted, he offers up the reason why authorities <clears throat> weren't able to find fingerprints in order to brag once again. <clears throat> He's in the interrogators. He's leaned over. He's got his elbows on the table. And he looks up, tilts his head to one side. And I've watched this scene three or four times to get the uh, audio, to Mm. get it transcribed. Fucking annoying. He's so cocky. He tilts his head to one side. He says, 
So the reason you didn't get any fingerprints on the door is I use my knuckles instead of my hand to open the door. And he nods and he goes, "Mm mm-hmm. And the reason you have no prints on me on any of the shell casings is I wear two pairs of gloves when loading every firearm, even in practice. Even my practice ammo doesn't get fingerprints. That's why I don't have to worry about collecting shells. If you wear one pair, you can still have a bleeding print because of the acids on your fingers. If you wear a glove on top of the glove, it causes friction between the two of them and negates that. End quote. The police. So when you're talking about gloves, you're talking about latex gloves? Yes, sir. But you wear two pairs, not one. One pair won't work. Police. Okay, so you use two pairs of gloves. (laughs) Yes, sir. Todd says. And so after that, Todd went on to find other victims. Todd, quote, okay, at that time, all three, manager, owner, and mom, they had heard the gunshots in the back and they were coming this way to figure out what had happened. I had all of a sudden, I had three people in front of me. Mom was the closest and I shot her two to three times in the chest. Not my best work. Her pattern was horrible. Oh my God. Right. She was actually surprised at her being in my path three times in the chest. Not my best work. Wow. Her pattern was horrible. That what is so the actual fuck? Deluded. Ugh. You could truly see Todd's narcissistic the guy, side the guy coming out in these in words, like a, especially. He thinks he's living in a Tom Clancy movie or some shit. Oh, yeah. The whole thing was just like a game to him, and he really wants these officers to be impressed. Mm-hmm. He wants to impress the police. Exactly. So, Todd, quote, she fell. The owner and the manager ran for the door, and at that range, they should have actually ran to me, not away. They were just too close. When I came around the door, it was boom, three people right there. Police. Okay, so then what happened? Todd. They ran to the door. In the process of that, I popped a few rounds. At this point, the interrogators are writing down Todd's statements, and he must wait for them to catch up. So Todd's getting impatient, and he really wants to tell his story. So the police are actually kind of using this, and in this point in the interrogation, they are. Nice. And I love it, because he's like, okay, I popped to... (laughs) rounds and hit their handwriting everything so <laughs> and he hates it he hates it. it's like his confession is the performance of his lifetime he doesn't look too happy to be interrupted right and he's it, getting it's pissed exactly like, You're ruining he's getting my annoyed. fucking moment however anytime he tries to go off on an ego tangent the n- investigators basically ignore it and bring him back to the straight facts of the case so i love that too right so todd quote then i proceeded to do a reload while this guy was still running but when i hit him He crumbled in the doorway. When I did my reload before this guy got out, I put two in him before he even got out, and he actually fell outside. That was a really fast reload, Todd says, laughing. What? Fucking what? Todd goes on to say he might have put an extra round in the guy who fell by the door as he walked over him, but he's not sure. He doesn't really remember. And then he says something so chilling and insensitive, it fucking blew me away. The police. At any point, did anybody, as they were falling, did they look at you? Did they face you? Did they say anything to you? Was there any conversation? Don't, please, whatever. Todd, no, sir. I don't remember hearing any of that. I'll tell you that once I engaged, I was engaged. (sighs) So at that point, it's almost like a video game. It's not a game, but it's almost like it. And you're focused on, but you, well, you've been there, sir. You know what I'm talking about. End quote. Fuck you, Todd. The right. odds of that police officer being in a hand, you know, shooting at a guy is very, very low. Most police officers Absolutely never fire their gun. Insane. What a fucking idiot. Ugh. What a fucking asshole. I can't imagine what it must have been going through the detectives' heads at this point. Saints. Seriously. To not choke that guy and lose their careers. Todd says Good he God. then walked around and put one last round in each victim's foreheads, got in his car, and drove home. He took the gun apart, put the pieces into parts of his trash, and even some in the cat litter, then disposed of that evidence in the dumpster. When the detectives go on to clarify some points, Todd just finds every opportunity to make it about himself. Yeah. He talks about the challenge of shooting multiple moving targets. He states, quote, I don't think I missed. If I did, it wasn't more than once. End quote. He goes on to reiterate how tough it is to hit a target that's moving as fast as they can. He's so fucking proud of himself. Sure is. He continues in the interrogation with st- statements such as, I may shoot somebody, that's one thing, but I'm not a pistol whipping and beating somebody. Yeah, that's not my thing. 
Because that's way better than shooting yeah. somebody, right? That shows that you're just a kind man. Uh, he even makes a point to say he wasn't initially planning on shooting the mom. Like, that gives him some sort of brownie points or something. So his quote was, I actually wasn't meaning to hit the mom. I prefer not to shoot women if I can. And I refuse to shoot a kid. Because he's a saint. What a great man. God. But at this point, nothing's too shocking coming from the man famous for saying, my golf game was weak. My kill game is strong. Oh, cheese bumps. Cheese. Yeah, his quote. What might be the most frustrating about the Superbike case in the end is that during the 13-year-long investigation, one asset that police gained was a sketch of a, of a potential suspect that a witness, presumably a customer who'd been one of the last people in the bike shop that day, had described. The witness remembered this man filling out paperwork to buy a particular bike. In 2012, the sheriff offered up a newly revised sketch to the media and said, I'm going to be bold enough to say, this is my man right here. Mm. And as accurate as the sketch was, it unfortunately wasn't able to catch Todd before he committed all these other atrocities. Mm -hmm. They just didn't recognize so him. The, so the artist, uh, the artist drawing of this guy was perfect. It was It was great. Huh. Yeah, I saw the artist drawing and I could totally see... The comparison. That's amazing to me. Just that art. It was just that good somebody shit. can do that, and yeah. just describing somebody's face that it well. He's a limp it's walrus. Like that. You know. Yeah. Now, to be honest, the raw footage of Todd's whole confession was tedious to watch at times. You see, Todd didn't want to write out his statement because he said he writes for a living and his hands hurt. So the detectives had to stop him after every sentence, and very slowly transcribe his confession. And at one point, even saying Todd uses big words and talks fast. They had to handwrite everything. Mm. Okay, so here's where things get super intriguing, though. Many people argue that this was actually a deliberate interrogation tactic. So I thought this was kind of smart. Uh, when you think about it, it makes sense. By playing dumb and making Todd feel like he's smarter than them, they subtly encourage him to keep talking freely and bragging about his accomplishments, not to mention repeating key details over and over again. Right. And on the same token, while some people have questioned why detectives even needed to write this down, all these answers in the first place, since the interview was being taped. Oh, they were fucking with his head for sure. Yeah. Others assert that suspects don't even realize they're being recorded and having someone write down their words right in front of them would make them feel even more secure that the conversation was not being permanently recorded. So therefore making them feel more comfortable and sharing more details or side comments that they might not otherwise share. And the interrogation goes on for hours. Mm, I bet. It's so long. You put a lot of time into this one. Yeah. As Todd was sealing his fate, investigators were conducting a thorough search of his property. They found a multitude of weapons and ammunition, such as handguns with silencers and rifles. But as there was no record of a background check under Todd's name for firearm purchases, it's believed that he illegally obtained these, which just adds to the laundry list of his crimes. Right. In 2017, Todd Kolhep pleaded guilty to seven counts of murder, two counts of kidnapping, and one count of criminal sexual assault. He entered a plea bargain that spared him from the death penalty and instead was sentenced to seven consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole, plus 60 years. I always think that's funny. Seven life sentences. If you are reincarnated as a butterfly, you come right the fuck back here. Relatives of the Superbike shooting victims filed a wrongful death lawsuit against him, and Kayla also filed her own civil lawsuit against Todd. She was awarded $6.3 million. However, even behind bars, Todd has not been silent. Oh my God, we all just want Todd to shut the fuck up! In late 2017, he wrote to the Spartanburg Herald Journal claiming that he had more victims who had yet to be discovered. Okay, unshut up, Todd. Which would go along with what he had told his mother right after he was caught. When she asked how many other victims there were besides the one he confessed to... Not enough fingers. He apparently said, you do not have enough fingers, Mom. I got this many. Maybe she's missing four fingers for some reason. Yeah. She gnawed them to the nubs having to raise this kid. In the eight-page letter to the publication, Todd wrote, quote, Yes, there is more than seven. I tried to tell investigators, and I did tell the FBI, but it was blown off. It's not an addition problem. It's a multiplication problem. He's the best. Quote, uh. leaves the state and leaves the country. Thank you, private pilot's license. End quote. Fuck your face, Todd. Yes. So Todd apparently earned his pilot's license and at some point... He's the best. ...could have potentially traveled to commit more unsolved murders. But he has also expressed that at this point, he doesn't see any reason to give numbers or locations for other victims. 
At the same time, though, Todd reassured investigators in 2016 that he hadn't, in fact, killed anyone else. And the quote is here. Police, have you killed anyone else in Spartanburg? No, sir, Todd says. Spartanburg, though. Have you killed anyone else in South Carolina? No, sir, Todd says. Other than the boy in Arizona with superbikes and the ones we have on the property, have you killed anybody else? I, this is why I ask you this. Then he looks at the police and says, yeah, you got enough. Oh. End quote. Hmm. What That's do you cryptic. think? What do you think? On one hand, it does seem a little suspicious that there would be a 13-year lull in between superbike shooting and Todd's next victims, yeah. which I find interesting. But I can also see how Todd might be showboating, yeah. just to get more attention now that uh, this case is tied down. This happens all the time yeah. with serial killers, too. Liar, always... liar, pants on fire. Well, they, I mean, it, it just their legend is all they have left, and right. you know, the more the kill count, and the people are weird. Well, Todd certainly is one of the most psychologically intriguing killers I've ever heard of. According to a forensic psychologist who's interviewed about 130 serial killers, Todd wanted to believe he was a good guy. He apparently doesn't want to be associated with the worst serial killers and has said, quote, I'm not a bad person, but I do bad things sometimes, end quotes. That makes you a bad person. (laughs) Sometimes he justifies it. It seems he justifies his murders in his head by classifying people into categories of good or bad. But obviously it's a childish mindset to have when you think you can judge someone's character and decide their life or death based on how it suits you. Perhaps his twisted personal philosophy and complete lack of remorse was best summed up when he told detectives, quote, I've never done anything to anybody who didn't have it coming. Fuck you, End Todd. End quote. Todd Colehep's story is especially disturbing, I think, because in the eyes of most people who knew him, he was just a normal guy, outgoing, maybe even a bit charismatic, and at the very least, successful. He's a guy you probably wouldn't even give a second look to if you passed him on the street, and you'd probably walk away from a conversation with him thinking he's a chatty, decent guy. And maybe... That's the most scary part of all, is wondering how many monsters like Todd are hidden in plain sight. 64% of them. So I want to throw in an edit here. I found this other article. Dustin Lawson, a man accused of buying firearms and silencers for Colehep despite knowing he was a convicted felon, faced federal charges. Mm. Lawson admitted to buying at least 12 guns and five silencers from 12, 2012 to 2016, lying that... They were for himself. Mm -hmm. So in 2018, he pleaded guilty to 36 federal firearms charges and was sentenced to eight years and three months in prison. He's currently serving his sentence and is scheduled for release in November 12th, 2024. That's where he got his guns from. Yep. That's where he got those guns. So anyways, that's the story. Well, fucking A. It's dipshit meter time. How dangerous is today's dipshit? Now, you guys know we have our five categories that we have. We have Mm -hmm. brutality, we have cruelty, Mm -hmm. we have the criminal mind, we have depravity, and then we have body count. Mm -hmm. And we're going to go through those, but let's start with brutality. Boy, I don't know how to get along with people well, do I? So he wasn't super brutal. I mean, he's Mm -hmm. a murderer and he's shooting people. But we've had shooters in the past and they don't get high brutality Mm -hmm. because it's not a brutal thing. Right. Well, he he was shooting. He was shooting to kill. Right. You know, he just he was uh, disposing is what he was doing. And it was quick and it was simple and it was a means to an end. So we gave him a 2.0 for brutality. Mm -hmm. Not super high. Now let's talk about cruelty. Did the dipshit enjoy the hurting? Cruelty was much higher. Yeah. I think cruelty is kind of his number one thing here. Just the basic psychological cruelty and the cruelty of his words. Yes. You know, it's the first time that's actually affected me. The horrible things that he said to people and about people. Mm -hmm. Just awful. About his victims. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And just the way he bragged about Mm -hmm. things. That's not cruelty. The bragging thing. Some of it is actually. Yeah. But he was victim shaming and he was victim blaming. Yeah. It's pretty ridiculous. Every time he opened his mouth, he was doing those two things, shaming and blaming. That was pretty bad. He must have been a terrible child to raise. Must have been awful. 3.75 we gave him on cruelty. Yeah. He's not the most cruel person that we have, but that was his, that was the thing he was doing the most out of our five categories. Yeah. Being a cruel cunt. All right. Now let's talk about his brain. How smart was the dipshit? So for his criminal mind, we gave him a 2.75. Yeah. And... 
he's a dumb fuck. I think that's a little higher than he deserves. I but think so too. But uh, he's a dumb fuck. But he also put a lot of effort into this shit yeah. too. I mean, so he thought that's about why. He, well, he, he gets it so kind of high. He put a lot of thought into some things like the double gloves. The, like the double thing, gloves. Which I don't know if that's true. Or not, I don't. But I'd I, love I, for someone. Well, they to didn't tell me. find any fingerprints. Right, and but I think maybe one pair of gloves would probably help too. Yeah, but maybe well, not. I don't know. And then using his knuckles to open the door, you know, the things that he admitted to. Then why the gloves? Just, you know. Yeah, he had some, some. He had some. Uh, burying things in the kitty litter. Yeah. It's like, okay. Yeah, but know. he could have he learned that from some crime book. I feel like you know almost I mean? all of this was that. It felt like he thought he was in that. That's what the way he was talking, especially or when he talks about the video episode, game. That the video game, and when he's talking to the girl about, I used to kill for the government and shit. Yeah. And it's like, you really think you're a goddamn he plays spot, you know? Way too many games. I don't know. Yeah, he's reads just, too many comics. I don't know. He's the wrong brain to to be involved in comics and games and yeah. movies and books. Like he, fiction for him isn't good because it's just ideas for him to be the bad guy and he doesn't realize that the the character the anti-hero character that people write about and that we all like like batmans and stuff mm-hmm. he doesn't realize that that's like you shouldn't want to be that it's not real <laughs> and you know he's not he's like but i'm batman but i'm i'm a bad good guy and it's like no uh, that's no. it's all fiction dude you're a fucking idiot what a dipshit all right so criminal mind we gave him a 2.75 mm-hmm. he's less than average but he got up there because he thought about it but he's just so f- well he left the fucking charlie's car it's it's on his property, and yeah. he spray painted it to camouflage it, and then right. threw some branches on top of it, and left cell phones yeah. laying around and shit, and, and didn't fucked know about around those with things. Charlie's cell phone, posted on his Facebook. I mean, come on, two point seven five might be a little too high. I Out know, of five, but he but did. He thought about some shit that was really good, right? And then other shit was fucking dumb. And he got away with. He would have got away with a few of them forever. Yeah. So, he got, so he gets a little bit of extra points for that. Yeah, but he had but to he brag. Did, yeah, he did. He, he had, had to brag. brag. He had to share. So now let's talk about his depravity. How depraved was the dipshit? Dude? Well, this one's usually a high one for the ones that we've covered in the past. This time, None. not so much. He's, he's a 1.5. Yeah. He didn't hardly do anything. He did kill people. Right. Um, but, but he justified was... it so much that he wouldn't be de- depraved. <laughs> but he did rape you know, so I mean, that is depraved. But so. in his mind, it wasn't rape. I know that's so. Isn't crazy. that weird? That's so crazy. What did he think was happening? You know, he. I'm I don't holding know. them against their will, but they like it. Yeah, yeah. That's that, what, that's not a kink. No, no. That's ugly. That's pretty fucked up. But a 1.5 for depravity yeah. because of it's usually cutting up nipple belts and shit right. is, is the high level. <laughs> so little, little, little. there weren't any nipple belts. <laughs> now let's talk Face about... Face lampshades. Yeah, exactly. Now let's talk about the body count. How much of a threat was this dipshit to the public? Yeah. So we have an official score for these because, yes. uh, you know, we have numbers here. And mm-hmm. so he's a sev- he had seven total kills that mm-hmm. he said that he did. Mm-hmm. Uh, there may be more. We speculate that there's more, but he even said that there wasn't more. Mm-hmm. But then but he then also he turned, said there, was, there more. was more. And yeah. it was probably in other countries. And thank God for his pilot's license. It's the best. <laughs> <laughs> but his body count officially for our scale is a 2.25 with seven. Yes. And so that gives us a, a final score of 2.45, which makes him very low on our scale. Mm-hmm. Out of the 13 serial killers we've covered now, he's number 11. So he's yeah. actually not very high. But we did add for this particular... Oh, because he pissed me off so much. <laughs> the infuriating personality. <laughs> uh, we gave him a five because he is hardcore to listen to. Oh, man. And that would have ra- that would have got him up there with Joseph Fritzl. Mm-hmm. It would have given him a 2.875. But yeah. we're not doing that. It's a 2.45 for him. Now let's talk about his notoriety. Have you heard of this dipshit? So as you guys know, we do before the trial, before they're caught, mm-hmm. after the trial, and their infamy overall. Right. And this is just to see how much he was in the news and how much of you know a threat he was as far as what the media was saying and all that good stuff. Right. So before the trial, before he was caught, we gave him a 1.5 because mm-hmm. there was a big gap between these things. Well, the, yeah, there was the uh, the superbikes crime, mm-hmm. um, that mass shooting that went cold. And of course that hit the news and then it, you know, they couldn't find the guy and it went cold. Mm-hmm. And then um, between really with the, the case that got him caught with Kayla, Kayla and Charlie's family were looking for them. And really what gave him a bit of notoriety there was taking to Facebook and making posts, Mm -hmm. you know, but that's pretty much it. You know, Charlie was evidently sharing his own missing persons pages, you know, the the missing persons posts and the posters. It's just ridiculous. Yeah. This guy's, 
too high on the criminal he mind. Was, we he, gave him too high, I think. He was <laughs> he was fucking with people. Yeah. But still pretty low, 1.5. Yeah, it was pretty low. Then after the trial, mm-hmm. when he was caught, it got we gave it a 3.0 because mm-hmm. it did go across the country. Yeah. Everybody heard of it. For a minute, everybody yeah. heard about it because it's just such there a was, gruesome well, case. And there was a video footage of them in the moment, video and audio of the police finding Kayla. Right. It was on video. And that kind of captivated yeah. the country and yeah. beyond. Yeah. But it didn't last. Mm-mm. And that probably pissed him off more, which I think is a great punishment yeah. for a person like this. Right. For uh, Creepy Todd, the cowardly cunt ass. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but we gave him a 3.0 for that. And then for his overall infamy, even though this is relatively recent, mm-hmm. it seemed to just die away. Yeah. And, and good. Serial killers shouldn't fucking have right. these legendary fucking Especially names. guys like him. Yeah. This Nobody guy doesn't remembers deserve you, to Todd. be remembered. Yeah, you're... You're a loser. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. No one's impressed. You're you're on the dipshit files. Yeah. And you shouldn't be proud to be on the dipshit files. No. Unless you're a UFO case or yeah, some weird that's oddity. Fun. That's, that's fun. That's fun. But that's when we're dipshits. That is confusing <laughs> to folks. But when it's a goddamn true crime, <laughs> fuck your dipshit file. Yeah. So overall, we gave him a 2.33. Basically an unheard of person. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's likely to stay that way. And that's probably good. Yep. So that's that. A 2.45 in the danger meter and a 2.33 in the notoriety meter. Now let's get to our conclusions. What do our dipshits think about this dipshit? I don't like him. I don't. Uh, fuck. I don't either. I think I've he been, sucks. I've been pissed I since I started. I've been so <laughs> irritated since I started this. I know. And I haven't been able to talk to you about it. <laughs> I know, right? We kind of do it so it's a surprise. To right. Me. So I'm walking around the house <laughs> and I'm like, motherfucker, god damn, this, this son guy. of a bitch. And Zach's like, hi, honey. I'm uh, like, hi. <laughs> <laughs> These quotes are. <laughs> Really unreasonable. I mean, I can't even imagine. This is back to, uh, we just did an episode where raising a psychopath, raising a narcissistic sociopath, yeah. fuck me. This would have, must have been a terrible child. I cannot, like, I will always think of the mom just laying their kid down and then locking their doors. <laughs> Sweet dreams, Annie. Yeah, and that, click, happens, click. that happens all over the place uh. in this country right now. Somebody listening to this might be like, yeah, I got a kid. I got to lock the door. Mm. And you know what? It's not. An, that can't be easy. No, it can't be. That, there's almost no place to go for help when it comes to that. And, you know, as a society, whatever that might be, we should probably think about that. Like, how do we help parents of sociopaths and psychopaths? How does, so, how does that work? You know, Can we do more? We did on the inside shit. We talked about my intolerance for force. Mm-hmm. Uh, we talked about um, my dis stain for somebody trying to force me or guilt me or hold anything over mm-hmm. my head okay right. so it's one of those things that fires me up and i dig in my heels right so in the event that i was the parent of a narcissistic or sociopathic or psychopathic child right i would not do well i would do the wrong thing <laughs> because i would be like no absolutely you're wrong right and here's why yeah and i would piss them off and they would piss me off and we'd go round and round and round and i'd probably create a siller serial killer and my kid would go on to bitch about me and what a terrible mother i was right because i was like no and the donahue donahue would be like i sounds like monique was a piece of shit i know it's like no donahue no you don't understand was- i was trying to get them to understand this is reality mm-hmm. This is justice. This is how things work. Yeah. This is right from wrong. But that's not how you keep the peace when you have so I don't that... want to keep the peace. I know. Well, you might and be a And that's the hard part. Maybe yeah. I am. It could be. Maybe I am. I think you just aired out that you're a psycho. I could be. That's fair. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, my little psycho. I just know, I guess there's, right and wrong is fairly clear cut mm-hmm. in my brain. Agreed. You know? And you want to raise your children to have that understanding I mean, that you can't do those things. And right. here's why, you know, and the concepts won't, won't be absorbed. That's again. So here we are. And, and bear, I guess I was lucky not to have like a, a yes, psychotic child. We're all lucky I, when that happens. Yeah. So, I mean, I was able to explain right from wrong and explain why it's wrong to my children. And for the most part, you know, they're like, oh, okay, I get it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I understand that. They didn't always do it. But right. they understood. Right. Yeah, and yeah. then they would, you know, I, I had one child that was like, better to, you know, act now and apologize later right. <laughs> than ask for permission. Right. They're both so. clever at getting in trouble, actually. <laughs> it was good times. Yeah. All right. Well, that has been Mr. Todd Cole Hep. Yeah. And what a piece of shit he is. Yes, he was. Uh, but yeah, not too high. Two, four, five. 
what an interesting character he was mm-hmm. or having money and having that land and having that attitude mm-hmm. and combining all that shit and growing up in prison really like yeah. 15 years in prison like, it amazes it amazes me that somebody could lie their way into a career like that yeah just lie and yeah. nobody thought twice about it it kind of reminds me of um that one guy that uh, uh robinson mm-hmm. who found who had the bodies johnny the, robinson yeah, yeah. that had the bodies on his property yep. silver-tongued scoundrel mm-hmm. yeah this is another one yeah he obviously con could, artist yeah. kind of blood yep he must have been mm-hmm Probably could have sold some cars. Yeah. No offense to you, car well, salesman. Definitely sold some houses. That's for sure. Right. No offense to you, realtors, Man. but he's one of you. <laughs> well, now y'all are suspect. Real tall. Fucking a. Let's talk about what we're gonna do next week. Oh yeah. Next week on the dipshit files. So next week on the dipshit files, we're gonna have a dude that eats people. Yeah, we're back to the cannibals. We're doing the cannibal thing for mm-hmm. June. And uh, what the fuck's his name? He's a piece of shit. I don't like him. He's a uh, peckish Pete. Yeah, that's his nickname, right? Mm-hmm. Peter Bryan. Peter Bryan. Mm-hmm. Two first names. Always probably not a good thing. Yep. So this is out of. Uh, I believe this is out of the UK. Mm. Um, maybe Wait. it was. Maybe it was British. No, it's British Columbia. Okay. Yeah, it was okay. Canada. Canada. So this guy uh, was, and I'm just starting my research. I've heard about him, and I've watched a couple documentaries. Um, but I'm just starting the He's going to be a research. crazy one, though. I, yeah. You told me some of the stories about he, him. He's going to be an interesting one. He's another one of those that, of course, is not going to be nearly as infuriating as Todd Cole had. <laughs> right. But uh, kind of frustrating because he fell through the cracks. He's another mm. one of those individuals with psychological issues we that We could have just, stopped him if we exactly. had some sort of... The yeah. problem is, is, in this world, is that we're trying to, to walk on this fine line between... Yeah. You know, individual liberties mm-hmm. and leaving people the fuck alone and mm-hmm. letting them live their lives and then judging as a society of like, this is unacceptable behavior, even if you're not committing crimes. Right. Like, there's this weird place where I understand. Yeah, I understand. It's, it's a very, it's, it's very a, subjective when it comes to. Well, it is. And it's a slippery slope when it comes to creating laws. Yes. According to this uh, government and, is not set up for this kind of thing well it's not you know and how do, do you humanely force someone into a mental mental institution against their will right how do you do that well, without taking away their personal liberties however they're psycho right they're well, psychotic and they need assistance they need help they need their medication but their personal liberties state that they shouldn't be forced to yeah. put anything in their body that they don't want. So right. it's a slippery slope. It is slippery. I mean, we don't really do uh, mental institutions in the same way we used Not to because like it. our answer now is pharmaceuticals. Mm-hmm. The pharmaceutical companies are like, no, we'll do it. We got this. And right. I don't know if it's working great or not. I don't think it is. It, I mean, you, the people have lot of to people take are their helped. meds. A lot of people are helped by this stuff. But well, the, the problem with mental... It's just not perfect. The problem with mental illness... Um, psychological illnesses is that they put them on medication to treat the symptoms of their illness and they start feeling better and they don't think they need the medication anymore because they feel pretty good right and they stop taking it yeah and the reason that they are feeling good is because of the medication and then they have a psychotic break and we have issues right so not saying that's all of these cases but that is a good number of cases that yeah. this happens with there's a there's a world that we don't talk about in this country that mm-hmm. has to because the majority of this fucking country seems to be whether it's by our own mm-hmm. hand or mm-hmm. by pharmaceuticals we are inebriated as fuck all the time we're a medicated country we yeah. are medicated all the time mm-hmm. and we don't really talk about that that much Mm-mm. you know there's been a lot of weird things that have happened in the last 20 30 years mm-hmm. that have kind of coincided Correlation doesn't equal causation, but right. have coincided with our change in diet and our change in uh, how much we pharmacide ourselves. Yeah. So there's that. Well, but, I am all for pharmaceuticals if it leads to a better life yeah. for the individual and those around them. Better living through better chemistry is exactly. absolutely good. Exactly. But there's got to be, uh, there's there's a lot of morality in there that we've, we've got to figure yeah. that out. And it it needs to be a discussion. When you're talking about a narcissistic psychopath yeah. that is willing to act out, mm-hmm. I mean, there's just, it's just like a criminal. I mean, there's no place for them in society that they can be. And not, that's why I said, not in an open th- there's society. a movie called Ray Li- by uh, starring Ray Liotta. <laughs> It's called No Escape. I don't and know. And it's just an island. It's like from the 80s or some shit. I, I had to, to find this DVD. <laughs> I had to go to the ends of the earth at one point. Uh, but I'm sure it's streaming somewhere anyway. But 
It's uh, an island where they put a bunch of criminals, and the criminals. The story is about what the criminals do. They okay. faction up, and it becomes this very interesting good and evil amongst the criminals. Okay. But why not just an island? Yeah. And, you know, it's like little. Yeah, well, who decides who goes to the I island? Do. You give me the decision. <laughs> no, I, I would never want that decision. No, definitely not the government either. Yeah, that's the big problem. It is a, it and is so a problem. So it becomes a family thing, mm-hmm. and that's where that's why I said I know that there's doctors and there's people that are doing things for mental health. But there's some stuff that maybe as a society we can discuss and do uh, to help the parents, you know, yeah. to be a little bit more understanding. Well, I understand it. You say it's a family thing, but I don't know one mother out there no, that know. would be like, yeah, lock them up. Right. You know, I, oh, I as know a mother, as a mother, you're very <laughs> compassionate towards your children and you want to give them chance after chance and it's after also, chance. It's also hard to admit yeah. as a person that, you know, through, because of DNA and blood and all the connections right. and stuff. That your child isn't like you, right? That like, is it's hard for people to admit. It that. is a very difficult. It's very difficult to divide yourself, even though you know it's mentally and emotionally healthy, to know that your child is a separate entity from yourself. Yeah, it's very difficult to get that through your heart. Now, yes. and I can't speak from a father's standpoint because I'm not a father, but I am a mother. Yeah, and I know I had to go through that transition, and uh, it was a good three or four years of pain. Right. Trying to understand that I am not my children. Right. But you understand that your your parents aren't you. No, I and get that. that. And yeah. If they it's, feel that way, then it's, then it's like, how dare your parents? I'm, exactly, I'm myself. And exactly. Exactly. And that's that. The same logic. Reversed. But it, it's getting it through my heart. Yeah. I, getting it through well my said. head is one thing, but getting it through my heart was very difficult. And that's, there was a mourning process that I went through. And once you get out the other side, it's a lot easier to see your children as grownups. Mm-hmm. Or if they are grown up, see them as um, sovereign individuals yeah. who make their own choices and have their own personalities. And it's not a reflection on you, no. the things that they do. Now, you can help them celebrate their victories mm-hmm. and feel pride for this beautiful individual that you assisted, you brought here and you assisted in their development. Mm-hmm. Um, but you should never, even as a parent, it is my opinion that you should never say, yeah, they did that because I did this because right. it takes never. away from their victory. I wouldn't take credit or, no. or a lot of, uh, you know, yeah. sh- there shouldn't be shame or pride really mm-hmm. in what you're doing. If you're doing a good job being a parent, that's your job. Yeah. Fucking. And, and if you're proud of them because you love them, that's your heart. Yes. And that's good. But and you, you know, should be proud of yeah. their accomplishments. But, but they are not doing it. Living vicariously through children mm-hmm. is, a, is a problem. Well, the reason I brought that up, sorry, I know a lot of parents <laughs> would look weirdly on that. They're like, well, yeah, I don't want to take away from my child's accomplishments. Yet these are the same parents that will take ownership of their faults. Right. And if you're going to take ownership of the child's faults, then understand by doing so, you're also by proxy taking ownership mm-hmm. of their accomplishments right. and that's Don't one, do that. that's one thing that you brought to my attention years ago where i was like oh okay so i can't take ownership for their faults i can't take ownership for their accomplishments i never would own their accomplishments right but i think you got it through my head by saying if you wouldn't do that then why would you do this Right. Why well, would you own their faults? We're always, and you're a good person. You're always quick to punish <clears throat> yourself over <clears throat> someone else, and that's mm-hmm. and that's good. You should be harsh re- with yourself, and you should be kind and forgiving to everyone mm-hmm. else. That's mm-hmm. a great way to live. Well, you but, know, you know I, ease I, up on yourself a little bit. I know. I, I speak about um, wanting to be left alone, and and it's it's a uh, at least in the inside shit. I shared a little bit, right. and part of my vitriol in the inside shit this week was simply because of my research <laughs> into this. Cup. Into this, uh, it, honestly, yeah. I was very irritated, <laughs> and I although I do feel that way about things uh, what we talked about in the inside shit. I don't fully one hundred percent invest in those emotions. I know. Yeah, yeah. Um, I did on Sunday. You're a good. You're a good citizen of the world. I. I don't hate people. I know. You have uh, some sol- human solidarity I very much. I don't see. like shitty people. I Who do. does? <laughs> I like to collect them in my life. And I had sunk myself into one of the shittiest people, in my opinion, out there. Well, now we've just done a two-hour podcast I on I feel them. so much better. You feel better? And I you don't do. ever have to look at this guy again. I feel so much better. Until and it's rerun time. I know it, I know it comes out. My, my anger comes out in, in It's cute as fuck over here. I'm just like, motherfucker. You can't see her little face. <laughs> it's like, nah, 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 nah. 
<laughs> well, thank you guys so much for listening yes, to thank you. Dipshit Files number 11 on Todd. I, I want to call him Creepy Todd the Cowardly Walrus. I yeah, don't know. Creepy the, Todd the Cowardly Walrus. You something. and your your syllables. I wanted to give him a lot of syllables. Yeah, I know. Because there was a lot of things that could describe him. <laughs> All right, guys, thank you for listening. <laughs> uh, we you. appreciate you guys with all the support. The mm-hmm. Like and subscribe and the rate and the review and the, all the things that you're supposed to do. Yeah, it's just, thank you to... Uh, just thank you for listening. Those um, in the shitbox. Oh, yeah. You know, thank you to... F- amazing community. Yeah. It's constantly the, some of the best memes on the internet, I would Absolutely. say, in the shitbox. And for the support from Lab Guy and yep. Discord Dookie Slayer. Yep, and thank everybody so in much. our litter box, all the patrons, mm-hmm. all our bosses, we appreciate you guys a ton. Yeah. And we'll see you next week, and we'll talk at you in the future. Yeah. But it will seem... Seem like the present. Mm-hmm. Bye. Bye. <laughs>